why the state has no origin. The humble beginnings of the sovereignty, bureaucracy, and politics. The cash for the origins of the state is almost all is almost as long standing and hotly contested as the pursuit of the origins of social inequality and in many ways it is just as much of a false event. It is generally accepted that today pretty much everyone in the world lives under the authority of a state like was a broad feeling exists their past politics such as Baroni Egypt, Shang China, the Inca Empire or the Kingdom of Many qualified as states or at least as early states. However, with no consensus among social theorists about what a state actually is, the problem is now to come up with a definition that includes all these cases but isn't so what as to be absolutely meaningless this has proved this has proved surprisingly hard to do our term the state only came into common usage in the late 16th century when it was coined by a french lawyer named jane bodin also got a who also wrote among many other things as influential critics on Whitcraft, where wolves and the history of sorcerers. He is rather remembered today for this for his profound hatred of women. But perhaps the first attempt a systematic definition was a German philosopher named Rudolf von Ehring, who in the late nineteenth century proposed that a state should be defined as a as any institution that claims a monopoly on the legitimate use of coercive works within a given territory. This definition has since come to be identified with the sociologist Max Weber. On this day, if on this definition, a government is a state if it lays claim to a certain stretch of land and insists that within its borders it's the only institution whose agents can kill people, beat them up, cut off parts of their body or lock them in the case, in the case or as one he, as one he in hearing, he hearing impresses, that can decide, it, decide who else that the right to do so on its behalf. For the hearing definition worked fairly well for modern states. However, it soon became clear that for the most of human history, rulers either didn't make, much, make such grandiose claims, or if they did, they cla their claims to a monopoly on coercive works held about the same status as their claims to control the tides on of the weather. To retain from inherent and Weber's definition, one would either to have concluded that say Hamugabi's Babylon, Socrates Athens, or, or England under, under William the Conqueror weren't states at all or come up with a more flexible or man's definition. Marxist offered one. They suggested that they suggested that states make their first appearance in history to protect the power of an emerging ruling class. As soon as one has a group of people living routinely of routinely off the love of another, the the argument run, they will necessarily create an apparatus of rule officially to protect the property rights in reality to preserve the advantage, a line of thinking very much in the rhetorician of Rousseau. This definition brought Babylon. Athens and medieval England back to the back into the fold but also introduced new conceptual problems such as how to define exploitation. And it was unpalatable to realize, calling out any possibility that the states could ever become a benevolent institution. For much of the 20th century, social scientists preferred to define a state in more purely functional terms. As society 
society became more complex, they argued it was increasingly necessary for people to create top-down structures of command in order to coordinate everything. This same logic is still followed its essence by most contemporary theories of social evolution. Evidence of social complexity is automatically treated as evidence for, for the existence of some sort of governing apparatus. If one speak, if one can speak, say, of a settlement hierarchy with four levels, e.g., cities, towns, villages, hamlets, and if at least some of those settlements also contain of contain full-time craft specialists, porters, blacksmiths, monks, and nuns, professional soldiers or musicians, then whatever apparat administered, it must if so far to be a state. And, e and even if that apparat did not claim a monopoly of force or support a class of early living of the toil of many laborers, this was inevitably going to happen sooner or later. This definition too has its advantages, especially when speculating about very ancient societies whose nature and organization has to be teased out has to be teased out from fragmentary remains, but its logic is entirely secular. Basically, all it's all it says is that since states are complicated, any complicated social arrangement must therefore be stated. Actually, almost all these classic theoretical formulations of the last century started off from exactly this assumption that any less complex society necessarily require a state. The real point of contention was why? Was it for good particular reasons? Or was it because any such society would necessarily produce a, a material surplus? And if there was a material surplus, like, for instance, all that smoke fish on the Pacific Northwest coast, then there would also necessarily be people who be people who managed to grab hold of a disproportionate share. As we've already seen in Chapter 8, these assumptions don't hold, don't hold up particularly well for the early cities. Early Uruk, for example, does not appear to have a state in any meaningful sense of the word. Of the word, was more when top-down rule, when top-down rule does emerge in the region of ancient Mesopotamia. It's not in the complex metropolises of the lowland river valleys, but among the small heroic societies, the surrounding foothills, which were at first to the very in principle of administration and a result, and a result that don't seem to qualify as states either. The, if there is a good ethnographic parallel for these later groups, it might be the societies of the northwest coast, since their two political leadership lay in the hands of gospel and vainglorious warrior aristocracy competing in extravagant contests over titles, treasures, the allegiance of commoners, and the ownership of slaves. Recall here that Haida, Tinglet, and the rest not only lack anything that could be called a state apparatus, they lack any kind of formal government, governmental institutions. One might then argue that states first emerged when the two forms of governance, bureaucratic and heroic, merged together. A case could be made, but equally we might ask if this is really a, such a significant issue in the first place, if it is possible to have monarchs, aristocracies, slavery, and extreme forms of patriarchal domination, even without a state, as if as it evidently was, and if it's equally possible to maintain complex irrigation systems or develop science and abstract philosophy without a state, and it also appears to be, then what do, then what do we actually learn about human history 
by establishing that one political entity is the what would like to this what we would like to describe as a state and another is an and another is an and the and they're not more interesting and important questions we could be asking in this chapter we are going to explore the possibility that there are what would history look if look like if instead of assuming that there must be some deep internal resemblance between the government the governments of say ancient egypt and modern britain and our task is therefore to figure out precisely what it is we were to look at the whole problem with new eyes there is no doubt that in most of the areas that the that so the rise of cities, powerful kingdoms, and empires also eventually emerge. What did they say? What did they have in common? Did they, in fact, have anything in common? What does their appearance really tell us about the history of human freedom and equality and all its laws? In what way, if any, do they mark a fundamental break without? With would come before in which we lay out a theory concerning the three elementary forms of domination and begin to explore its implications its implications of for human history. The best way to go about to go about this task is suggest is by returning the first the first principles. We have already talked about fundamental even primary forms of freedom, the freedom to move, the freedom to disobey orders, the freedom to reorganize social relations. Can we speak similarly about elementary forms of domination? Recall how Rosso, in his famous thought experiment, felt that everything went back to private property, and especially property in land, in that terrible moment when a man when a man first threw up a berry and said, This territory is mine and mine alone. All subsequent forms of domination, and therefore all subsequent catastrophes, became inevitable. As we have seen, this observation with property rights as the basis of society and as a foundation of social power is a peculiarly Western phenomenon. Indeed, if the West had, if the West had uh, any real meaning, it would probably refer to that legal and in, in intellectual tradition which conceives society in those terms. So, to begin a thought experiment of a slightly different kind, it might be good to start right here. What are we really saying when we say that the power of a feudal aristocracy or a landed gentry, gentry or absentee landlords is based on, on land? Then, we use such language as a way of cutting through airy abstractions of high-minded pretensions to address simple material re realities. For example, the two dominant political parties in the in 19th century England, the Whigs and the Tories, like to, pre like to present like themselves as agreeing about ideas, a certain conception of free market li liberalism a certain notion of tradition. An historical, an historical materialist might object that, in fact, Wicks represented the interests of the commercial classes and the tourist, and the tourist those of the land landowners. They are of course right. It would be foolhardy to deny it. What we might question, however, is the, is the premise of the landed or any other form of property is itself particularly material. Yes, soil, stones, grass, hedges, farm, farm buildings and granaries are all material things, but when one speaks of landed property, what one is really talking about is an individual's claim to exclusive access and control over all the soil, stones, grass, hedges, hedges etc. Within, within a specific territory. In practice, 
this means a legal right to keep anyone else of it land is only really is on is only really yours in this sense is no one would to would think to challenge your claim over it or if you have the capacity to summon at will people with weapons to threaten or attack anyone who disagrees or just enters without permission and refuses to leave even if you should the trespass trespass yourself you still need others to agree you, you were within your rights to the soul in other words landed property is not actually soil rock or grass it's a legal understanding maintained by subtle mix of morality and the threat of violence in fact land ownership illustrates perfectly the logic of what Rudolf von hearing called the state's monopoly of violence within a territory just within a ship with just within a smaller territory than a nation state all this might might sound a little abstract but it is a simple description of what happens in reality as any reader who has ever tried to skirt a piece of land occupy a, la a building or for that matter overthrow a government will be keenly aware ultimately everyone knows it all comes down to whether someone will eventually be given orders to remove you by force and if and if it does then everything comes down to whether that some someone is actually will to follow orders revolutions are rarely won in open combat where revolutionaries win it's usually because of the bar because the bar of those sent to cast them refuse to sort or just go home so that that means so that so does that mean property like like political power ultimately derives as chairman mouse so delicately put it for the bear of a gun or at best from the ability to command the loyalties of those trained to use them no or not exactly to illustrate why not and continue and continue our thought experiment let's take a different sort of property consider a diamond necklace if kim kardashian walks down the street in Paris wearing a wearing a diamond necklace worth millions of dollars billions of dollars she is not only serving off her wealth she is also flaunting her power over violence since everyone assumes she would not be able to do so without the existence feasible or not of an armed personal security detail trained to deal with with potential thieves property rights of all sorts are ultimately backed up by what legal theory or theories like von e hearing euphemistically called force but let us imagine for a moment what would happen if everyone or earth was suddenly to become physically inf invulnerable say they all drank a potion which made it impossible for anyone to harm anyone else could kim kardashian still maintain exclusive rights over her jewelry well perhaps perhaps not if she sold it off to regularly since so since someone would presumably snatch it but she certainly could if he if she normally kept it hidden in the safe the combination of which she alone knew and only revealed to trusted audiences at events which were announced in advance so there is a second way of ensuring that one has access to rights another to be to do not have the control of information only kim and her closest confidence now where the diamonds are normally kept or what or when she is likely to appear wearing them this obviously applies to all forms of property that are ultimately backed up by the threat of force landed property works in stores and so forth if humans were incapable of hurting each other no one would be able to declare something absolutely sacred to themselves or to defend it against all the world then they could only exclude those who agreed to be excluded still let let us take the experiment a step further and imagine everyone on earth drank another potion which rendered them, them all incapable of keeping a secret 
but still unable to harm one another physically as well. Access to information as well as force has no win equalities. Can Kim still keep her diamonds? Possibly. But only if she manages to convince absolutely everyone that being Kim, being Kim Kardashian, she is such a unique and extraordinary human being that she actually deserve, de deserves to have things no one else can. We would like to suggest that these three principles, call them control of violence, control of information, and individual charisma, are also the three possible places of social power. The threat of violence tends to be the most dependable, which is which is why it uh, why it has become the basis of uniform systems of law everywhere. Charisma tends to be the most ephemeral. Use, usually, all treats, all usually all three occurs to some degree, even in some even in societies where interpersonal violence is rare. One may well one may well find hierarchies based on knowledge. It doesn't even particularly matter what that knowledge is about. Maybe some sort of technical know-how, say of smelting copper, or using herbal medicines, or maybe something we consider total mumbo jumbo, the name of the twenty-seven hells and thirty-nine heavens, and what creatures one would be likely to meet if one traveled there. Today, it is quite commonplace, for instance, in part of Africa and Papua New Guinea, to find initiation ceremonies that are so complex as to require bureaucratic management, where initiates are, where initiates are gradually introduced to higher and higher levels of arcane knowledge in societies where there are otherwise no formal ranks of any sort. Even, even where such hierarchies of knowledge do not exist, there will obviously against always be individual differences. Some people will be considered more charming, funny, intelligent, or physically attractive than others. This will always make some sort of difference, even within groups that develop elaborate safeguards to ensure that it doesn't that it doesn't. As for instance, with the ritual mockery of such hunters among egalitarian foragers like the Hadza. As we've noted, an egalitarian egalitarian ethos can take one of the two directions. It can either deny such individual quirks entirely and insist that people are, or at least should be, treated as if they were exactly the same, or it can celebrate the quirks in such a way to imply that everyone is so profoundly different that any overall ranking would be inconceivable. After all, how do you measure the best measurement against the most dignified elder, against the persons, against the person who tell the funniest jokes, and so on? In such cases, it might happen that certain extreme individuals, if we may call them that, do, if we may call them that, do gain an understanding, an, an outstanding, even leadership role. Here. We might think of newer puppets of certain Amazonian shamans, Malagasy, Mbomasi, or astrologer magicians, or for that matter, the rich burials of the Upper Paleolithic, which are often focus on individuals with striking the anomalous physical and probably of their attributes. As those, as those examples imply, however, such characters are so highly un unusual that it will be difficult to turn the authority into any sort of ongoing power. What really concerns us about these three principles is that each had is that is that each has become the base of institutions now seen as foundational to the modern state. In the in the case of in the case of control over violence, this is of use. Modern states are sovereign. They hold the power once held by kings, which in practice translates into one inherent monopoly on the legitimate use of coercive force within their territory. In theory, a true sovereign exercised a power that was above such 
was above and beyond the law. Ancient kings were rarely able to enforce this power systematically. Often, as we've seen, their supposedly absolute power really just meant they were the only people who could meet out arbitrary violence within about 10, 100 yards of where they were standing or sitting at any given time. In modern states, the very same kind of power is multiplied a thousand times because it is combined with the second principle, bureaucracy. As Weber, the great sociologist of bureaucracy, observed long ago, administrative organizations are always based not just on control of information, but also on official secrets of one sort or another. This is why the secret, the secret agent has become the mythical symbol of the modern state. Of the modern state, James Bond, with his license to kill, combines charisma, secrecy, and the power to use uncountable violence, underpinned by a great bureaucratic machine. The combination of sovereignty with sophisticated administrative techniques for storing and tabulating information in Tabulating information introduces all sorts of threats to individual freedom. It makes possible surveillance states and totalitarian regimes. But this danger, we are always assured, is offset by a third principle, democracy. Modern states are democratic, or at least it generally felt they really should be. Yet, demo yet democracy in modern states is conceived very different to, say, the, working of the workings of an NCB assembly in an ASEAN day, ASEAN city, which collectively deliberated on common problems. Rather, democracy, as we have come to know, is effectually a game of winners and losers played out among large, larger than life individuals, with the rest of us reduced largely to onlookers. If we are seeking an ASEAN president, to this aspect of modern democracy, we shouldn't turn to the assemblies of Athens, Syracuse of Cor or Corinth, but instead paradoxically to aristocratic contents, con contests of hairy ages, such as those described in the Iliad with, the, with its endless agons, races, duels, games, gifts, and sacrifices, as we noted in chapter 9. The political philosophers of later Greek, of later Greek cities, did not actually consider elections a democratic way of selecting candidates for public office at all. The democratic method was sortition of lottery, much like modern jury duty. Elections were assumed to belong to the aristocratic mode, aristocracy meaning rule of the best, allowing commoners much like the returners in an old-fashioned hero aristocracy to decide who among the well-born should be considered best of all and well-born in this context simply meant all those who couldn't afford to spend much of their time playing at politics. Just as access to violence, information and charisma he finds the very possibilities of social domination. So the modern state is defined as combination of sovereignty, bureaucracy, and competitive poli political field. It seems only natural, then, that we should examine history in this light too. But as soon as we try to do so, we release there is no actual reason why these three principles so should go together let alone reinforce each other in the precise fashion we have come to expect from governments today. For one thing, the three elementary forms of domination have entirely separate historical origins. We've already seen we've already seen this in ancient Mesopotamia, where initially, where initially the bureaucratic commercial societies of the rival valleys existed in tension with the hairy polities of the hills and their endless pretty princelings, vying for the loyalty of returners to spectacular contests of one sort of another or another, while, hill peop while the hill people in turn rejected the very principle of administration. 
nor is there any compelling evidence that ancient Mesopotamian cities even when ruled by royal dynasties as if any means of real territorial sovereignty so we are still a long way here from anything like an embryonic version of the mod of the modern state in other words they, they simply weren't states in full inheritance of the time and even if they had been it makes little sense to define a state simply in terms of sovereignty recall the example of the Natchez of luciana when great when great whose great son with absolute power within his own great or small great village where where he could order some many excursions and appropriate goods pretty much as he had my had a mind to but whose subjects lost ignored him when he wasn't around the divine kingship of the Siluk and Nilotic people of East Asia, of East Africa, work on similar lines. There were very few limits on what the king could do to those in his physical presence, but there was also nothing remotely resembling an administrative, an administrative apparatus to translate his sovereign power into something more stable or extensive or tax system, no system to enforce royal orders, or even report on whether or not or not or, or not they had been obeyed. As we can as we can now begin to see more than as as we can now begin to see more than states are in fact an amalgam in an amalgam of elements that happen to have come together at certain point in human history and agreeably are now in the process of coming apart again consider for instance how we currently have planetary bureaucracies such as the wto or imf with the corresponding principle of govern of global sovereignty when historians, philosophers, or political scientists argue about the origin of the state in ancient Peru of China, what they are really doing in projecting that rather unusual constellation of elements backwards, typically by trying to find a moment where something like sovereign power came together with something like an administrative system, the competitive political fit is usually considered somewhat somewhat optimal or somewhat optimal what interests them it precisely is precisely how and why these elements came together in first place for instance a standard politic a standard story in human political evolution taught by earlier generations of scholars was that states arose from the need to manage complex irrigation systems or perhaps just large constant concentrations of people and information this gave rise up this case this gave rise to the top power to the to the to top down power which in turn came to be tempered eventually by democratic institutions that would imply a sequence of development somewhat like this as we saw in chapter 8 contemporary evidence from ancient Eurasia now points to a different pattern when urban administrative systems inspired a cultural counter-reaction, a further symbol of schismogenesis in the form of scrabbling highland princedoms, barbarian, barbarians from the perspective of the city dialects, which eventually leads to some of these princes establishing themselves in cities and systematizing, systematizing, systematizing their power. This may have, this may well have a have, this may well have happened in some cases mesopotamia for example but it seems unlikely to be the only way in in which such developments might culminate in something that to us at least resembles resembles a state in other places and times often in moments of crisis the process may begin in the elevation to preeminent roles of charismatic individuals or inspire the followers to make a radical break with the past. Eventually, such figureheads assume a kind of absolute cosmic authority 
which is finally translated into a system of bureaucratic, bureaucratic roles and offices. The pet, the, the pet then might look more like this. What we are challenging here is not any particular formulation, but an, but the underlying teleology. Are all these accounts seem to, to assume that there is only one possible end point to this process, that this that these various types of domination were somehow bound to come together sooner or later in something like the particular form taken by modern nation states in America and France at the end of the 18th century, a form which was gradually imposed on the rest of the world after both world wars. What if, what if this wasn't true? What we are going to do here is to see what happens if we approach the history of some of the world's first kingdoms and embrace without any such preconceptions. Along with the origins of the state, we'll also be putting aside such similarity for French and theological notions of, as the birth of civilization or the rise of social complexity in order to take a closer look at what actually, at what actually happened. How did large-scale forms of domination first image, and what did they actually look like? What, if anything, do they have to do with arrangements and endure to this day? Let's start by ex examining those few cases in the pre-Columbian Americans, pre-Columbian Americas which, if, which even the greatest sticklers for the definition tend to agree with states of some kind. On Aztec, on Aztecs, Inca and Maya, and then also Spaniards. The general consensus is that there were only two, ambi two unambiguous states in the Americas at the, at the time of the Spanish conquest, the Aztec and the Inca. Of course, that is that is not how the Spanish would have referred to them. Hernan Cortes, in his letters and communicators, wrote of cities, kingdoms, and occasionally republics. He hesitated to refer to the Aztec ruler Moctezuma as an emperor, presumably also as not to risk groveling to the defeat of his own lord, the modern, the most Catholic emperor, Charles V. But it would but it would never have occurred to him to ponder whether any of these kingdoms or cities qualified as states since the concept barely existed at the time. Nonetheless, this the question which has preoccupied modern scholars, so let us consider consider each of these polities in turn. We will begin in with an anecdote recorded in a Spanish source not long after the conquista. About the, about the raising of children in the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, shortly, be, be, shortly before it fell to Spanish forces, at bad boys were given a seal with four arrows. The midwife prayed that they might be courageous warriors. They were, present, they were presented four, four times to the sun and told of the uncertainties of life and the need to go to the war. Girls on the, on the other land, were given spindles and shutters as a symbol of their future dedication, dedication to homely tasks. It is hard to say how what spirit this practice was, but it points to something fundamental in Aztec society. Women still occupied important positions in Tenochtitlan as merchants, doctors, and priests, priests but they were excluded from an from an ascendant class of aristocrats whose power was based on warfare, predation, and tribute. How far back this aggression of female political power was among the Aztecs is unclear. Certain lines of evidence, such as the obligation for high-ranking high officials at court to take on the occulty role of Chihua Kotal or snake woman, suggest not far at all. What we know is that masculinity often expressed to sexual violence, become part of the dynamics of imperial expansion. Indeed, the rape and enslavement of conquered women were among the primary grievances reported to Cortes, henchmen by Aztec subjects and Veracruz, who by 19, 
who by 1519 were willing to take the changes with a band of unknown Spanish, unknown Spanish free voters. Male nobility among the Aztecs of Mexico seemed to have viewed life as an eternal contest or even, contest, or even conquest a cultural tendency which they trace back to their origins as an itinerant community of warriors and colonies, colonizers. There's, there's seems to have been a capturing society not unlikely some of the other most recent Amerindian societies with export but on an infinitely greater scale. The name is taken in work or kept nurtured to ensure their fatality sometimes in luxurious circumstances but then finally killed by ritual specialists to repay a primordial debt of life to the gods and presumably for any number of other reasons too at Tecnotitan's Templo Major. Templo Major, the result was a veritable industry of pure plate plating, which some Spanish observers took as clear, took as clear proof that the Aztec rulings, ruling places were in league with Satan. This is how the Aztecs attempted to impress their neighbors, neighbor, their neighbors, and it is still how they impress themselves on the human imagination today. The image of thousands and of prisoners waiting in line to have their hearts torn out by Mark's God, this God impersonators, is admittedly difficult to get out of one's head. In other respects, however, the 16th century aspect seemed to the Spaniards to present a rather familiar picture of human government, certainly more familiar than anything they encountered in the Caribbean or in the swamps and savannas of Yucatan. Monarchy, ranks of official dom, military cadres, and organize, organized religion, however demonic, were all highly developed. Urban planning in the field of Mexico, as some Spaniards remarked, seemed, seemed superior to what was found in their Castilian cities back home. Some Tory laws, no less elaborate than in Spain, kept a respectable distance between governing and governed, dictating everything from fashion to sexual mores. Tribute and taxation were overseen by Calpixque, who, appointed from among the ranks of commoners, were unable to turn their knowledge of administration into political power, a preserve of noblemen and, and warriors. In the conquered territories, local nobles were kept in place, obedience, obedience being assured by patronage system that tied them to sponsor at the Aztec, to sponsors at the Aztec God. Here, here too, the Spaniards found resonance with the practice of Ike principally, which granted autonomy to newly acquired territories so long as the local headmen supplied annual tits to the crown. Like the Spanish Habsburgs, who become their overlords, the Aztec, the Aztec warrior or the aristocracy had risen from relatively humble origins to create one of the world's largest empires. Even the people alliance felt, however, when compared with what the conquistadors found in the Peruvian Andes. In Spain, as in much of Eurasia, mountains over Montes of refused from the coercive power of kingdoms. Of in, in Spain, in much of Eurasia, Montes offered refused from the coercive power of kings and kingperos, rebels, bandits, and heretics hid out in the highlands. But in Inca Peru, everything seemed to work the other way, the other way round. Montes from the backbone of imperial power. This upside down to European eyes, political world coercive atop the Andean Cordillera was the super kingdom of Tawan, Tawantin, Tawantin Suyu, meaning Cortes Closed One. More precisely, Tawantin Suyu refers to the four Suyus of or major administrative units of the Sapa Incas domain. From their capital at Cusco, 
where it was said even gas was made of gold in car of royal blood extract period meat, periodic meat a rotating global tribute or coffee from some one million of, of, of subjects distributed across the western littoral of South America from Quito to Santiago, exercising a degree of sovereignty over 80 contiguous provinces and countless ethnic groups. By the end of the 15th century, the Inca had achieved something like the universal monarchy, Monarchia Universalis, that the, Habs that, that the Habsburgs, rulers of numerous scattered territories, could only conjure in their dreams. Nevertheless, if Tawantinsuyu is to be considered a state, it was still very much a state in formation, just as the popular image of the Aztecs turns on mass, turns on mass carnage. Popular images of the Inca tend to portray them as master administrators, as we've seen enlightenment and thinkers like Madame de Gravigny and Harry Dirks and Harry Dirks formed their first impression of what a welfare state or even state socialism might be like by contemplating accounts of the empire in the Andes. In reality, in cash efficiency was decidedly uneven. The empire, after all, was over 2,500 2, miles long. Well, 2,500 miles long in villages at any appreciable distance from Cusco, Chan Chan, or other centers of royal power, the, the imperial apparatus meet at, be at best a sporadic appearance and many villages remain largely self-governing. Chronicles and officials like Juan Polo de Ondegardo de Zarate were intrigued to discover that while typical Andean villages did indeed have a complex administrative apparatus, the apparatus appeared to be entirely homegrown based on collective associations called Ailu. In order to accommodate imperial demands for tribu or co-filable, local communities had merely tweaked this collective slightly. The imperial center of the Inca Empire forms a stark contrast with that of the Aztec. Moctezuma, despite his grandeur, his palace contained everything from an aviary to cartes for tropes or cosmic dwarfs. Was officially just the Tlatoani or first speaker in a council of aristocrats and his empires and his empire officially a triple alliance of three cities from all the bloodthirsty spectacle. The Aztec Empire was really a confederation of, uh, of noble families. Indeed, the spectacle itself seems to have been at least partly rooted in the same spirit of aristocratic world upmanship that spurred Aztec nobles to compete in public ball games or, for that matter, philosophical debate. In Inca, in contrast, insisted the sovereign was himself in the incarnate sun. All authority derived from a single point of radiance, the person of Sapa Inca or Uni Inca itself, cascading down was two ranks of royal siblings. Of, of royal siblings. The Inca court was an incubator, a hot house for sovereignty, compressed, with, compressed within its, its walls were not only the household of the living king and his sister who was also called who was also his koya but also the administrative heads chief priests an imperial guard of the kingdom most of them most of them blood relati relatives of the kingdom of the king being a god the sapa inca never really did never really died the body of forming, former kings were preserved, wrapped and not mummified, much like the pharaohs of ancient, ancient Egypt. Like the pharaohs too, they had caught from beyond the grave, uh, receiving regular offerings of food or clothing from the Roman ruler estates. 
though unlike the mummified bodies of, Egy of Egyptian pharaohs, which at least remain confined to their tombs, the Peruvian equivalents were wheeled out to attend public events and sponsored festivals. One reason why its new ruler was obliged to expand the empire was precisely this. They only inherited the old ruler, the ruler's army, his court, lands and retainers remain in the dead in cash hand in cash hands. This extraordinary concentration of power around the Inca's own body had a flip side, while the authority was extremely difficult to delegate. The other important officials were honorary, were honorary Inca, who, while not directly related to the sovereign, were allowed to wear the same ornaments and were otherwise seen as an extension of his personage. Statue doubles or other substitutes may also be employed. There was an elaborate ritual protocol surrounding this, but to do anything important, the Sapa Inca's personal presence was required, meaning the court was continually on the move, with the royal person being regularly carried to the four quarters in a little in a little line with silver and feathers. This, as much as the need the need to the to carry armies and suppliers, required enormous investment in gold in systems, converting one of the world's most complex and vast terrains into a continuous network of, of well-maintained highways and step paths, punctuated by shrines of hawkers and way stations, stock and staff with uh, stock and staff, stock and staff from the royal coffers. It was on one such annual tour. Far from the walls of Cusco, the the the, the last Sarpa Inca, Atahualpa, was abducted by Pizarro's men and subsequently killed. As with in, as with the Aztecs, consolidation of the of the Inca's empire seems to have involved a great deal of sexual of sexual violence, and resulting changes in gender in gender roles. In this case. What began as a customary system of marriages became a template for class domination. Traditionally, in those parts of the Andes where people were divided by social rank, women were expected to marry into families of higher status than their own. In doing so, the bride's lineage was said to be conquered by the grooms. What began as a kind of ritual vigil of speech seems to have been turned into something more, more little and systematic. In each newly conquered territory, the Incas immediately built a temple and forced a court of, of local virgins to become the rise of the sun. Women cut off from their families keep either as permanent virgins or dedicated to the Sarpa Inca for him to exploit and dispose of as he pleased. In consequence, the, the king's subjects could be referred to collectively as conquered women and local nobles and local nobles jockey from the position for position by trying to place their daughters in prominent roles at at court what then what then what then of the foremost in administrative systems system it did certainly exist records were kept largely in the form of noted of noted things called Kipu or Kipu, described in Pedro Seca de Leos Conica del Peru, 1553. In each provincial center, they had accounts who were called not keepers orders, Kipu Kamayuks, and by means of these notes, they kept the record and account of what they of what had been given a tribute by those people in the district from the silver, gold, clothing, hat animals, to the wool and other things, down to the smallest items, and by the same notes they commissioned a record of what was of what was given over one year or ten or twenty years, and they kept the accounts so well that they did not lose a pair of sandals. Spanish chronicles provided few details, however, and after the use of kipu was officially banned in 1583, 
local specialists had little incentive to commit their law to writing. We don't know exactly how it how it works, although this although the sources of information are still emerging from remote Andean communities, but it turns out in cas in Castaquipus and associated forms of knowledge were kept in use until much more recent times. Scholars argue scholars argue about whether Kipu should be considered a form of writing. What does form what sources we do what sources we do have mainly discard the numerical system Noting the hierarchy arrangement of color coded notes into decimal units from 1 to 10,000, but it seems the most elaborate, si si it, the most elaborate string borders in code records of topography and genealogy, and most likely also narratives and songs. In many ways, these two great polities, Aztec and Inca, were ideal targets for conquest. But were organized around easily identifiable capitals inhabited by easily by easily in the identifiable kings who could be captured or killed and surrounded by peoples who were either long accustomed to obeying orders or if they had any inclination to throw off power from the center were likely to do so precisely by joining forces which would be conquistadors. If an empire is based largely on military force, it is relatively easy for a superior force of the same kind to seize control on, of its territory, since if one takes control of that center, as Cortes did by laying siege to Tenochtitlan in, in 1521, or Pizarro by seizing Atahualpa at Cajamarca in 1532, Everything else falls readily into place. There might be stubborn resistance. The siege of Tenochtitlan took over a year of grueling horse to horse fighting. But once if what it was over, the, conquer the conquerors could take over many of mechanisms of rule that already existed and start conferring orders to subjects called in obedience. Where there are no such powerful kingdoms, either because they had never existed, as in much of North America or Amazonia, or because a population had con consciously rejected central government, things could get decidedly trickier. A good example for such decentralization is the territory inhabited by speakers of the various, various Maya languages, the Yucatan Peninsula, and the highlands of Guatemala and Chiapas to its south. At the time of the initial Spanish incursion, the region was divided into what seemed to the settlers an endless succession of tiny principalities, townships, villages, and seasonal hamlets. Conquest was a long, conquest was a long and laborious business, and no sooner was it completed, or at least no sooner had the Spanish decided, decided it was completed that the new authorities faced an apparently endless series of popular revolts. As early as early as 1546, a coalition of Maya rebels rose up against Spanish settlers and, despite brutal reprisals, resistance never really died down. Prophetic movements were a second major were a second major wave of insurrections in the 18th century and in eighteen forty eight a mass rising almost drove the settlers' descendants out of Yucatan entirely until the siege of the capital at Merida was interrupted by the planting season. The resulting cash war, as it was called, continued for generations. There were still rebels holding out in parts of Quintana Roo at the time of the Mexican Revolution in the second decade of the 20th century. Indeed, you could argue that the same rebellion continues in, other, in another form with the Zapatista movement that controls large parts of Chiapas today. As the Zapatistas also saw, it was in, this in, it was in these territories where no major state or empire had assisted for centuries that women came 
most prominently to the four in anti-colonial struggles, both as organizers of armed resistance and as defenders of indigenous tradition. Now, this anti-authoritarian this anti-authoritarian streak might come as something of a surprise to those who know the Maya as one of a triumvirate of New World civilizations, Aztec, Maya, Inca, familiar from books on art history. Much of this art, from what from what's called the classic Maya period, roughly AD 150 to 900, is excitingly beautiful. Most derives from cities that once exist that was existed in what are now the Tengu rainforest of Britain. On first appraisal, the Maya in the in this period seem to have been organized into kingdoms much like those of the Andes of Central or Central Mexico, only smaller, but that our picture and until quite recently was dominated by sculpted, mo sculpted monuments and grave inscriptions commissioned by the ruling elites themselves. This focus, predictably enough, on the death of great rulers holder of the title Ajao, especially the conquests, as alliances of, the, of independent cities, city states fit for, he, for hege, hegemony over the lowlands under the leadership of two rival dynasties those of Tikal and the Snake Kings of Kalakmul. These monuments tell us a great deal about the rituals such rulers conducted to commune with, the, with their divinist, divinist ancestors, but precious little about what ordinary, what ordinary life was like for their subjects, let alone whom, let alone how these subjects felt about these rulers' claims to cosmic power. If there were poverty movements or period insurrections during the classic Maya period, as there were in as there as there were in the colonial period, we would currently have few ways to know about them, although archaeological research may yet change this picture. What we do know is that in the final centuries of the classic period, women attained a new invisible a new visibility in sculpture and inscription, appearing not just as consorts, princess and queen's mother and queen mothers, but also as powerful rulers and spirit mediums in their own right. We also know that at, this, at the, we also know that at some point in the 19th century, the classic Maya political system came apart, and most of the great cities were abandoned. Archaeologists argue about what happened. Some theories assume that popular resistance, some combination of defection, mass movements, or outright rebellion must have played a part, even, even if most are understandably reluctant to draw to form a line between cause and consequence. It is significant that one of the few urban societies which endure even grew was located in the northern lowlands around the city of Chichen Itza. Here, kingship seems to have dramatically changed, in, changed its character, becoming a more purely ceremonial or even theoretical affair, so hedged about by ritual that any serious political intervention was no longer possible, while day-to-day -to -day -to -day governance apparently passed largely into the hands of a coalition that form among collectives of prominent warriors and priests. Indeed, some of what were uh, once as assumed to be royal palaces in this post-classic period are now being re reinterpreted as assembly halls or popolna for local representatives. By the time of Spaniards arrived, six centuries after the collapse of cities in Petén, Mayan societies were truly decentralized, passed into a into a bewildering, bewildering variety of townships and principalities, many without kings. The books of Chilambalam, Prophet Anas, written down in the late, in the late 16th century, dwell endlessly on the disasters and miseries that befall oppressive rulers. In other words, there's every reason to believe that the spirit, the spirit of rebellion which has marked this particular region can be traced back to at least the time of Carlemagne.
the 18th century AD. That and that then the then the cost the centuries of bearing Maya rulers were quite regularly and repeatedly disposed of. Undoubtedly, the classic Maya artistic tradition is magnificent, one of the greatest the world has ever seen. By comparison, artistic products from the post-classic as the period from roughly AD 900 to 1520 is now, often seem clumsy and even worthy of appreciation. On the other hand, how many of us would really prefer to live under the arbitrary power of a petty warlord who, for all his patronage of fine arts, counts tearing the hearts out, the hearts out of living human bodies among his most significant, significant accomplishments? Of course, history is not usually true. Uh, is not usually true about in such terms, and it, and it is worth a second why. Part of the reason is simply the generation of post, the generation post classic, which are just little more than an afterthought. It may seem a trivial issue, but it matters because such habits of two are one reason why periodics of why periods of relative freedom and equality tend to get sidelined in the last in the larger sweep of history. This is important. Let's look. Let's look at it further because we return to our three forms of domination, in which we over a degradation on the shape of time, and specifically how metamor how metaphors of God and decay into in and decay introduce unnoticed political biases into our view of history. History and archaeology abound with terms like proto and proto, like post and proto, intermediate or even terminal. To some degree, these are products of early 20th century cultural theory. Alfred Kober, a preeminent anthropologist of history, spent decades of a research project aimed at, at determining if identifiable laws lie behind the rhythms and patterns of cultural growth and decay. Whether systematic relations could be established between artistic and fashion, economic booms and bursts and, and burst periods, periods of intellectual creativity and conservatism and the expansion and collapse of empires, it was an intriguing question. But after many years, his ultimate conclusion was, no, there were no such laws. In his configurations of cultural growth, 1944, Kober examined the relation of the arts, philosophy, science, and population across human history and found no evidence for any consistent pattern. Nor has any such pattern been successfully discerned in those few more recent studies which continue to plow the same furrow. Despite this, when we write about when we write about the past today, we almost invariably organize our thinking as if such patterns really did exist. Civilizations are typically represented either as flower-like growing, blooming, and then shriveling up, or else like a, or, a, or else as like some grand building, mistakenly constructed but prone to sudden collapse. The latter term, the latter term tends to be used indiscriminately, indiscriminately for situations like the classic Maya collapse, which did indeed involve a rapid abandonment of some hundreds of settlements and the disappearance of real people, but equally it's used for the collapse of the Egyptian old kingdom when the only thing when the only thing that really seems to have declined pre precipitously is the power of Egypt's elites ruling from the northern city of the, of Memphis. Even in the Maya case, to describe the entire period between AD 900 and 1520, as post-classic is to suggest that the only really significant thing about, about it is the degree to which it can be seen as the warning of a golden age. In a similar way, in a similar way, terms like proto palatial Crete, pre-dynasty Egypt or formative Peru convey a sense of impatience, as if minuance, 
Egyptians or Andean peoples spend centuries doing like doing little but laying the groundwork of such of such a, for such a golden age, and it is implied for a strong stable government to come ab to come about. We've already seen how this played out in Uruk, where at least seven centuries of collective self self rule, also termed for dynastic in early scholarship comes to be written of as mere prelude into the real history of Mesopotamia, which is then presented as a history of Kankeros, Dinas, Lawgivers, and Kings. Some periods are, dim as, are dismissed as prefaces, others as postfaces. Still others become intermediary. The ancient Andes and Mesoamerica are cases in point, but, but probably the most familiar and the most striking example is again that, that of Egypt. Muslim girls will no doubt be familiar with the vision of ancient Egyptian history into old, middle, and new kingdoms. Each is separated by an intermediate period, often described as epochs of chaos and cultural degeneration. In fact, these were simply periods where they, when there was no single ruler of Egypt, authority devolved to local factions, or as we will shortly see, change its nature altogether. Taken together, this intermediate period spent about a third of Egypt's ancient history, down to the ascension of a series of foreign of vassal kings, known simply as the late period, and they saw some very significant political developments of their own. To take just one example, a Thebes between 754 and 525 BC, spanning the third intermediate and late periods, a series of, of five unmarried, childless princesses of Libyan and Nubian descent, descent were elevated to the position of God's wife of Amun, a title and role which acquired not just supreme religious but also great economy and political weak at this time. In official representations, these women are given throne names framed by cartoches just like kings and appear leading royal festivals and making offerings to the gods. They also own some of the richest estates in Egypt, including extensive lands and a large staff of priests and scribes. To have a situation in which women not only command power on such a scale, but in which this power is linked to an office reserved explicitly for single women, is, is, is historically unusual. Yet, this political innovation is little discussed, partly because it is already framed within an intermediate or later or late period that signals is transitory or even this decadent, decadent nature. One might assume the division into old, middle, and new kingdoms is itself very ancient, perhaps going back thousands of years of years of to Greek of years to Greek sources, like the third century BC Egyptiaca, composed by Egyptian chronicler Maneto, or even to the hieroglyphic he hieroglyphic records themselves. Not so. In fact, the pre partic division only began to be proposed by modern Egyptologists in the late 19th century. In the terms to introduce it, they introduced initially Greek or Empire related kingdom, were explicitly modeled on European nation states, German, particularly Prussian. Scholars played a leading role here, the tendency to perceive ancient Egypt's past as a series of cyclical alternations between unity and disintegration clearly echoes the political concerns of Bismarck's Germany, where an authoritarian government was trying to assemble a unified nation state from an endless variety of tiny statelets. statelets. After the First World War, a European owned regime of all monarchies was coming apart. Prominent Egyptologists such as Adolf 
Erman granted the intermediate periods their own place in history, drawing comparisons between the end of the Old Kingdom and the Bolshevik Revolution of their own time. With, in, with hindsight, it's easy to see just how much these chronological themes reflect their author's political concerns, or even perhaps a tendency were casting their minds back in time to imagine themselves either as part of the ruling elite or as having roles somewhat analogous to ones they had in their own societies. The Egyptian or Maya equivalents of Muslim curators, professors, and middle range functionaries. But why then have these schemes become effectively canonical? Consider the Middle Kingdom. 2055 until 1650 BC, represented in standard histories as a time when Egypt moved from the super scales of the first intermediate period into a new radio phase of strong and stable government, bringing with it an artistic and literary, and literary renaissance. Even if we set aside the question of just how chaotic the intermediate period really was. We'll get we'll get to that soon. The Middle Kingdom could equally will be represented as a period of violent disputes over royal succession, crippling taxation, state sponsored suppression of ethnic minorities, and the growth of force labor to support royal mining expeditions and, co and construction projects and construction projects not to mention the brutal plundering of egypt's southern neighbors neighbors for serfs and god however much future egyptologists will come to appreciate them the elegance of middle kingdom literature like the story of sinuhe and the proliferation of osiris cuts the cast lightly offer light little solace to the thousands of military conscripts, forced laborers, and persecuted minorities of the time, many of whose grandparents were living quiet peaceful lives in the preceding dark age. Dark ages. What is true what is true of time incidentally is also true of space for the last five thousand years of human history, i.e. Roughly the span of time we will be, we will be moving around in over the course in this chapter. Our, our conventional vision of world history is a checkerboard of cities, empires, and kingdoms. But in fact, most of this, but but in fact, for most of this period, these were exceptional islands of political hierarchy, surrounded by much larger territories whose inhabitants. If visible at all to historians' eyes, are variously described as tribal confederacies, amphitheonies, or if you are anthropologists, sedimentary societies, that is, people who systematically avoided fixed overarching systems of authority. We know a bit about how such societies work in parts of Africa, North America, Central or Southeast Asia. Or other regions where such loose and flexible political associations existed in the recent times, but we know for certainly little of how they operated in periods when they were by far the world's not most common forms of government. A too radical account, perhaps, would retell human history from the perspective of the time and places in between. In that sense, this chapter is not truly radical. For the most part, we are telling the same old story, but we are at, but we are at least trying to see what happens when we drop the theology, theolo, teleological habit of thought, which makes us score the ancient, the ancient world for embryonic versions of our modern nation states. We are considering instead the possibility that. When looking at those times and places is really taken to mark the birth of the state, we may in fact be seeing how very different kinds of power crystallize, even with its own peculiar mix of violence, 
knowledge and charisma are three elementary forms of domination. One way to test the value of a new approach is to see if it helps us is if it helps us explain what had previously seemed anomalous cases, that is, ancient polities, which are then undeniably mobilized and more organized enormous numbers of people, but but which don't seem to fit any of the usual definitions of a state. Certainly, there are plenty of this. Let's start with the Olmec, generally as generally seen as the first great Mesoamerican civilization. On politics a spot the Olmec case how precisely to describe the Olmec has proved a difficult problem for archaeologists to grapple with early 20th century scholars referred to them as an artistic or cultural horizon largely because it wasn't clear how else to describe a style easily identifiable by certain common types of spottery anthropomorphic figurines and stone sculpture that seemed to pop up between 1500 and 1000 BC across an enormous area studying the isthmus of the Tehuantepec, Tehuantepec and including Guatemala, Honduras and much of the southern Mexico but whose meaning was otherwise uncertain. Whatever the Olmec were, whatever the Olmec were, they, they seem to represent the modern culture as it came to be known. Of all later Mesoamerican civilizations, have invented the region's characteristic calendar systems, glyphic, glyphic writing, and even ball games. At the same time, were not, there was no reason to assume that the Olmec were a unified ethnic or even political group. Dear, there was much speculation about wandering missionaries, trading empires, early fashion styles, and much else besides. Even today, archaeologists came to understand that there was, in fact, an Olmec heartland in the marshlands of Veracruz, where the swamp cities of San Lorenzo and La Venta arose along the fringe of Mexico's Gulf Coast. The internal structure of these Olmec cities is still poorly understood. Most seem to have been centered on ceremonial precincts of a certain layout, but including large earthen pyramid mounds surrounded by extensive suburbs. This monument, these monumental epicenters stand in relative isolation amid an otherwise fragmented and relatively unstructured landscape of small mist farming settlements and seasonal forager camps. What can we really say, then, about the structure of Olmec society? We know it was in no sense egalitarian, there were clearly marked elites, the pyramids and other monuments suggested, at least at certain times of year. These elites had extraordinary resources of skill and labor at the disposal. In every, in every other respect, though ties between center and hinterland appear to have been surprisingly superficial, the collapse of the first great Olmec city at San Lorenzo, for instance, seems to have had very little impact on the wider regional economy. Any further assessment of Olmec political structure has to be called with what many consider its synoptic achievement, a series of absolutely colossal sculpted heads. These remarkable objects are freestanding, carved from thoughts of basalt and of a quality of compar and of a quality comparable with the finest ancient Egyptian stonework. Each must have taken untold hours of grinding to produce. These sculptures appear to be representations of all the leaders. But intriguingly, they are depicted wearing the later helmets of bell players. All the known examples are sufficiently similar that each seems to reflect some kind of standard ideal of male beauty. But at the same time, each is also different enough to be seen as a unique portrait of a particular individual champion. No doubt. There were also actual ball gods, 
although this have both was supposedly elusive in the archaeological record and while we obviously don't know what kind of game was played if they were anything like later maya and aztec world games they likely took place in a long and narrow court with two teams from high-ranking families competing for fame and honor by, stake, by staking a heavy rubber ball with the hips and botox and botox it seems both reasonable and logical to conclude that there was a fairly direct relationship between competitive games and the rise of an all aristocracy without writing with written evidence it's hard to say much more but looking a bit closer at later mesoamerican ball games might at least gives uh, give us a sense how he how, of how this work in practice stone ball courts were common features of classic maya cities alongside royal residences and pyramid temples some were purely ceremonial others were actually used for sport the chief maya gods were themselves ball players in the kitchen maya a big in the kitchen maya epic popol fu a ball game provides the setting in which mortal heroes and underworld gods call it leading to the birth of the hero twin hunafu and Bala, Squa, swalang balang balang who go who go on to beat the gods at their own deadly game and ascend to take their own place among the stars the fact that the greatest known maya ep the greatest known maya epic centers on a ball game gives us a sense of how center of, of how central the spot was no maya notions of charisma and authority so to in a more physical way does an inscribed staircase built in Yazidan to mark the ascension in ad 752 but what was probably its most famous king known as Pert Jaguar the Great. On the central block, he appears as a, bo as a ball player, flanked with, bo with two dwarf attendants. The king prepares to strike a huge rubber ball containing the ball of a human captive, bound, broken, and bonded. As it tumbles down a flight of stairs, capturing high-ranking enemies to be held for ransom or filling payment, to be killed at ball gamblers were the major objective of Maya warfare. This particular unfortunate feature may be a certain Gerald Skull, a noble from a rival city whose humiliation was important to Bert Jaguar that he also made it the central feature of carved little on a nearby temple. In some parts of the Americas, Competitive sports serve as substitute, substitute, substitute for war. Among the classic Maya, one was really an extension of the other. Battles and games form a part, form part of an annual cycle of royal competitions, played for life and death. Both are recorded on Maya monuments as key events in the lives of the rulers, of the rulers. Most likely, these elite games were also mass spectacles cultivating a particular sort of urban politic, the sort that releases gladiatorial contests and thereby comes to understand politics in terms of opposition. Centuries later, Spanish conquistadors described as the factions of the ball game played at the noted land where players confronted each other amid racks of human skulls. They reported how reckless commoners carried away in the competitive favor of the, of the tournament would sometimes lose all they had or even gamble themselves into slavery. The stakes were so high that so a, play, so a player actually sent a ball through one of the stone hoops adorning the side of the court, these were made so small as to render it nearly impossible. Normally, the game was won in other ways. The contest ended immediately, and the players 
and the player who performed the miracle received all the goods worked as well as any others any others he might care to pillage from the onlookers. It's easy to see how why they all make with their intense fusion of political competition and organic spectacle are nowhere seen as cultural progenitors of later Mesoamerican kingdoms and empires, but there is little evidence that they all built themselves if they created an infrastructure for, for dominating a large population. So far as anyone knows, knows the rulers did not did not command a stable military or administrative apparatus that might have allowed them to extend their power throughout a wider hinterland. Instead, they proceeded over a remarkable spread of cultural influence radiating from ceremonies from ceremonial centers, which may only have been densely occupied on specific occasions such as ritual ball games, scheduled in concert with the demands of the agricultural calendar and largely empty at the other times of year. In other words, if, there were, if this were states in any sense at all, then they are probably being defined as seasonal versions of what Clifford Kids once called theater states, where organized power was released on the pre-duct periodically in grand but fleeting spectacles, anything we might consider that craft from diplomacy to the stockpiling of resources existed in order to facilitate the rituals rather than the other way around. Javin de Huantar, an empire built on image, an, an empire building of, built of images. In South America, we find a somewhat analogous situation. Before the Inca, a whole series of other societies are ident identified tentatively by scholars as states of empires. All these societies occur within the area later controlled by the Inca, the Peruvian Andes and the adjacent coastal drainages. Non-use writing, at least in any form we can recognize. Still, from AD 600 onwards, many did employ knotted strings from record keeping and probably, and probably other forms of notation too. Monumental centers of some, some kind were already appearing in the Rio Super region in the 3rd millennium BC. Later, between 1000 and 200 BC, a single center, a Chavin de Huantar, in the northern highland of Peru, extended its influence over a much larger area. This Chavin horizon gave way to three distinct region cultural cult cultures. In the central highlands, arose a militarist polit polity known as Wari. In parallel, on the shores of the lake Titicaca, a metropolis called Tiwanaku at, two, at 420 hectares, roughly twice the size of Uro of Mohenjo-Daro, to form using an ingenious system of rice field, fields of, to grow its crops on the freezing hex of the Bolivian at Altiplano. On the north coast of Peru, a third culture known as Moche displays staring funerary evidence of female leadership, live storms of various priestesses, priestesses and queens dressed in God and flank by human sacrifices. The first European to the first Europeans to study these civilizations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries assumed that any city or set of cities with monumental art and architecture exerting its influence of a surrounding region must be the capitals of the states of empires. They also assume, ju who, just as wrongly, it turns out that all the rulers were male. As with the Olmec, a surprisingly large proportion of the influence seems to have been come in the form of images distributed in an in the Andes case on small ceramic vessels, objects of personal adornment and textiles, rather than 
in the, sp in the spread of administrative, military, or commercial institutions and their associated technologies. Consider carving the Juanta itself, located high in the Mosna Valley on the Peruvian Andes. Archaeologists once believed it to have been the core of pre-Inca pre Empire in the first millennium BC, a state controlling a hinterland that stretched to the Amazonian rainforest to the east and the Pacific coast to the west and included all the intervening highlands and coastal drainages between. Such power seems commensurate with the scale and sophistication of Charvin's cut stone architecture, its unrivaled abundance of monumental sculpture, and the appearance of Charvin motifs on pottery, jewelry, and textiles across the wider region. But was, but was Kevin really some kind of group of the Andes? In fact, later evidence has emerged since they suggest this. In order to get a sense of what might really have been going on at Chavin, we must look more closely at the sort of images we're talking about in what they tell us about the wider importance of vision and knowledge in Chavin notions of power. The art of Chavin is not made up of pictures, still less pictorial narratives, at least not in any intuitively recognizable sense. Neither does it appear to be pictographic writing system. This one, this is one reason why we can be fairly certain we are not dealing with an actual empire. Real empires tend to favor styles of visual art that are, that are both very large but also very simple, so the meaning can be easily understood by anyone they wish to impress. If an Archimedes Persian if an Achaemenid, Achaemenid Persian emperor carved his likeness into the side of a mountain, he did it in such a way, in such a way that anyone, even an ambassador from lands as yet unknown to him, for, or an antiquarian of some remote future age, would be able to recognize that it is indeed the image of a very great thing, a very great thing, a very great king. Chevin images, by contrast, are not found and uni uninitiated. Christy eagles, Christy eagles, caught in on themselves, furnishing into a mess of ornament, human faces grow snake-like fangs, or contort, or contort into a valid grimace. grimace. No doubt other features escape our attention altogether. Only after some study do even the most elementary forms reveal themselves to the untrained age, to untrained eye. With due attention, we can eventually begin to tease out recurrent images of tropical forest animals, jaguars, snakes, caimans, but just as the eye of a tunes to them, they slip big from our field of vision, winding in and out of each other's bodies of merging into complex patterns. Some of these images are described by scholars as monsters, are, uh, as mon monsters but they have nothing in common with the simple composite features of ancient Greek, ancient Greek faces of, of Mesopotamian sculpture, centaurs, griffins, and the like, or the Moshe equivalence, we are in another kind of visual universe altogether. It is the realm of the sub shifter, where nobody is ever quite stable or complete, and diligent mental training is required to tease out structure from what at the what from what at first seems to be visual mayhem. One reason why we can say any of this with a degree of confidence is because that arts of caffeine appear to be an early and monumental manifestation of a much wider Amerindian tradition in which images are not meant to illustrate or represent, or represent but instead serve as visual cues for extraordinary face of memory. Up until recent times, a great many indige indigenous societies 
were still using systems of broadly similar kinds to transmit esoteric knowledge of ritual formulae, genealogies, or, or, or records of shamanic journeys to the world of ketonic spirits and animal familiars. In Eurasia, similar techniques were developed in the ancient arts of memory. Where those trying to memorize stories, speeches, lists of similar material would each have a similar memory palace. This consisted of a mental pathway or room in which a series of striking images could be arranged is a cue to a particular episode, incident or name. One can only imagine what might happen if someone were to draw a, or carve one such set of in the official cues and a later archaeologist or art historian were to discover it with no idea of the of the context, let alone what the story being memorized was actually about. In the case of Chafin, we actually, we actually can be on fairly safe ground in assuming that these images were caused in some manic, of some many journeys, not just because of the peculiar nature of the images themselves, but also because of a wealth of circumstantial evidence relating to altered states of consciousness. A job in itself, snuff, snuff spoons, small ornate mortars, and bone pipes have been found, and among its five images are sculpted male figures with fangs and snake headdresses holding aloft the stock of the San Pedro Cartus. This plant is the basic is the base of Huahuma, a, mes a mescaline based infusion still made in the region today which induces psychoactive fissions. Other calf in figure other calf features. All of them apparently male are, sur are, sur are, sur are surrounded by images of vulcan leaves and Nantera SP which contain a, a, a powerful hallucinogen. Release when the leaves are, are gone up and snorted, it induces a gush of mucus from the nose, as faithfully depicted on sculpted heads that line that line the walls of Kafin's major temples. In fact, nothing in the Kafin's monumental landscape really seems concerned with secular government at all. There are no few military fortifications or administrative quarters. Almost everything, on the other hand, seems to have something to do with ritual performance and the revelation of concealment of esoteric knowledge. Intriguingly, this is exactly what indigenous informants were still telling Spanish soldiers and chroniclers who arrived at the site of, at the site in the 17th century. For as long as anyone could re could remember, they said, Chevin had been a place of pilgrimage but also but also one of supernatural danger on which the heads of important families covered from different parts of the countries to seek visions and oracles the speech of the stones. Despite initial skepticism, archaeologists have gradually come around to accepting that they were right. It's not just the evidence for ritual and altered state of, states of mind, but also the extraordinary architecture of the palace. The temple at Chavin, the temple at Chavin contains stone labyrinths and hanging staircases which seem designed, designed not for communal acts of worship but for individual trials, initiations and vision quests. The implied turtles journeys ending at an ending at narrow corridors, large enough for only a single person beyond which lies in a tiny sanctum containing a monolith carved with dense tangles of images. The most famous such monument, a stella called El, El Lanzon, the lens, is a shaft of granite of the 30, of a 13 feet, fall, feet tall, around which the old temple of Kevin was constructed. A well lit replica of the stella, often assumed to represent a god who is also the Axis Mundi or a central pillar connecting the polar ends of a salmon universe, has spread of place in Peru's, in Peru's Museo de la Nación 
but the 3000 years old but the 3000 year old original still original still resides at the heart of dark darkened dark image illuminated by thin slats where no single fever could ever grasp the totality of its form or meaning if Chavin, a remote precursor of the, to the Inca, was an empire, it was one built on images linked to esoteric knowledge. Olmec was, on the other hand, a, an empire built on spectacle, competition, and the personal attributes of political leaders. Clearly, our use of them, our use of the term empire, here, here is about as loose as it could as, as loose as it could possibly be possibly be neither was remotely similar to say the roman or han or indeed the inca and Aztec empires nor do they fulfill any of the important criteria of statehood for statehood at least not on most standard sociological definitions monopoly of violence levels of administrative hierarchy and so forth the usual recourse is to describe such regimes instead as complex systems, but this, but this too seems hopelessly inadequate. A shorthand way of saying looks somewhat like a state, but it is, but it isn't one. This tells us, this tells us precisely nothing. What makes more so? What makes more sense, we suggest, is to look at these other West Pasting cases through the lens of our three elementary principles of domination control of violence, of sovereignty, control of knowledge, and charismatic politics outlined at the start of the chapter. In doing so, we can see how it stresses a particular form of domination to an exceptional degree and develops, and develops it on an unusually large scale. Let's give it a go. First, in the case of Chavin, power over a large and dispersed population was clearly about retaining control over certain kinds of knowledge, something perhaps not that far removed from the idea of state, of the, of state secrets found in, the later, found in later bureaucratic regimes although the, the, the content was obviously very different and there was little in the way of military force to back it up. In the Olmec tradition, power involved certain formalist ways of competing for personal recognition in an, in an atmosphere of play less with, with risk. A prime example of large-scale competitive political field, but again, in the absence of territorial sovereignty or an administrative apparatus, no doubt there was a certain degree of personal charisma in Jokai at Kevin. No doubt among the Olmec, too, some obtain influence but there by their command or akin knowledge. But neither case gives us reason to think anyone was asserting a strong principle of sovereignty. We refer to this as first order regimes because they seem to be organized around of the three uh, around one of the three elementary forms of domination knowledge control for Chavin, axiomatic politics for Olmec to the relative neglect for, of the other two. The obvious next question then is where the examples of the third possible variant can also be for EIE cases of societies which develop a principle of sovereignty that is grant an individual or small group of monopoly on the right to use violence with impunity and take it to extreme lengths without either an apparatus for controlling knowledge or any sort of competitive political field. In fact, there are quite a lot of examples. Admittedly, the existence of such a society could probably be more difficult to establish from archaeological evidence alone. But to illustrate this third variant, we can turn, fortunately, to more recent Amerindian societies where written, where written documentation is available. As always, we must be careful with, with such sources since they are written by European observers who not only broke 
their own biases, but tended to describe societies already enmeshed in the chaotic destruction that Europeans themselves almost invariably brought in the in the week in the week. Still, French accounts of the Nazis of Southern Louisiana in the 18th century were seen to describe exactly the sort of arrangement we are interested in. By general consent, the Nazis who called themselves Theolel, Theoloel, or People of the Sun, represent the only undisputed case of divine kingship north of the Rio Grande. The ruler enjoyed an absolute power of command that would have satisfied or satisfied a Sarpa Inca or Egyptian pharaoh, but they had a minimal bureaucracy and nothing like a competitive political field. As far as we know, it has never occurred to anyone to refer to this arrangement as a state. On sovereignty, we thought this, we thought the state. Let us turn to the work of a French Jesuit, Father Maturin Le Petit, Father Maturin Le Petit, who gave an account to the Natchez in the early 18th century. Le Petit found the Natchez to be to be nothing like the people Jesuits has encountered in what in what is now Canada. He was especially struck by the religious practices. This revolved around a settlement of the all the French sources referred to as the Great Village, which centered on two great earthen, two great, two great earthen platforms separated by a plaza. On one platform was a was a temple, was a temple. On the other, a, on the other, a kind of palace, the house of a ruler called the Great Sun, large enough to contain up to four thousand people, roughly the size of the entire Natchez population at the time. The temple, in which an eternal fire burned, was dedicated to the founder of royal dynasty. The current ruler, together with his brother, called the Tattooed Serpent, an elder, an, an elder sister, the white woman, were for their own parts treated with something that seemed very much like worship. Anyone who came into their presence was expected to bow and wail and to retreat backwards. No one, not even the king's wives, was allowed to share a meal with him. Only the most privileged, privileged could even see could even see him eat. What this meant in practice was that members of the royal family lived out their lives largely within the confines of the great village itself rarely venturing beyond. The king is the king himself emerged mainly during tours of times of war. Le Petit and other French observers who at the time lived under the suzerainty su of Louis the Fourteenth, who who of course also fancied himself as a also fancied his, himself a son king, were quite fascinated by the parallels as a result. They described the going the goings on in the great village in some detail. The Natchez great son might not have had the guardian of Louis the Fourteenth, but had but what he lacked in that regard, he appeared to make up for for in terms of sheer personal power. French observers were particularly struck by the arbitrary executions of Natchez subjects. The property conflict confiscations and the way in the which in which uh, at royal funerals court retainers court, re, court retainers would often apparently quite willingly offer themselves up to be strangled to accompany the kid son and his cause family members in that those sacrifices those sacrifice on such occasions consisted largely of people who were up to that point immediately responsible for the king's care and his physical needs, including his wives, who were invariably commoners, the Natchez was the Natchez were matrilineal, so it was the white woman's children that succeed to the dawn. Many, according to voice accounts, were to their deaths voluntarily, even joyfully. One wife remarked 
how she dreamed of finally being able to share a meal with her husband in another world. One paradoxical outcome of this one paradoxical outcome of these arrangements was that for the most of the year the great village was largely depopulated. As noted by another observer, Father Pierre de Carlevoix, the, the great village of the Natchez is at present reduced to a very few cabins. The reason which I heard for this is that the savages from whom the great chiefs the good chef has the right to has the right to take all they have, get as far away from his as they can, and therefore many villages of this nation have been formed at some distance for, from this, away from the good village. Ordinary, ordinary natures appear to have led very different lives, very different lives, often showing blissful disregard of the wishes of their ostensible rulers. They conducted their own independent commercial and military ventures, and sometimes flatly refused royal commands obeyed by the great sons, emissaries, or relatives. Archaeological surface of the Natchez Blues region bear, bear this out, showing that the 18th century kingdom in fact comprised semi autonomous districts, including many settlements that were bought that were both larger and wealthier in trade goods than the great village itself. How exactly are we to understand these situations? It might seem paradoxical, but historically such arguments are not particularly unusual. The great son was a sovereign in the classic sense of the term, which is to say he embodied a principle that was seen as higher than law, therefore no law applied to him. This is a very common bit of cosmological reasoning that we find in some form or another, almost anywhere, al almost anywhere from Bologna to Mbanza, Congo. Just as God or God on the a principle existing beyond good and evil could have created good and evil to begin with, so divine kings cannot be judged in human terms, behaving in arbitrarily violent ways or to anyone around them if to anyone around them is a self proof of their concerned status. Yet at the same time, they are expected to be creators and enforcers of systems of justice. Such of such with with not just to the good son was said was said to be descended from a child of the sun who came to earth bearing a universal god of laws among the most prominent of which we were which of which we were prescriptions against death and murder. Yet the great son himself ostentatiously violated those laws on a regular basis as if to prove his identification with a principle prior to law and therefore able to create it. The problem with this sort a problem with this sort of power, at least for the sovereign's vantage point, is that it tends to be inten intensely personal. It is almost impossible to delegate. The king's sovereignty extends about as far as the king himself can walk, reach, see or care or be carried. Within the cycle, within the cycle, it is absolute. I'll say it. It attenuates rapidly. As a result, in the absence of an administrative system, and the Natchez king had only a, had only a handful of assistants, came to claim to lab, claims to labor, tribute or obedience could, if considered odious, be simply ignored. Even the absolutist monarchs of the Renaissance like Henry VIII or Louis, or Louis XIV had a great deal of trouble delegating the authority, that is, convincing the subjects to the royal representatives as to saving anything that the same deference and obedience due to the king himself. Even if one does develop an administrative apparatus as they of the courts did, there is the additional problem of how 
of how to get administrators actually to do what they told and by the same token how to get anyone to tell you if they aren't as late as the 1780s as Max Weber liked to point out where the, the good of Prussia found that his repeated efforts for to free the country's vessels came to nothing because bureaucrats would simply know the, the, the decrease or if challenged by his, his legates. Insisted the words of the decree should be interpreted as saying the exact opposite of what was obviously intended. In this sense, French observers were not entirely of were entirely of the mark. Natchez court really could be considered a sort of hyper concentrated faction of factionalists. On the on the one hand, Gertzan's power in his immediate presence was even more absolute. Louis could not actually his could actually snap his fingers and order someone executed on the spot, while on the other, his ability to extend the power was even more restricted. Louis did, after all, have an administration at his, at his disposal, to, though a fairly limited one compared to modern nation states. Nature's sovereignty was effectively bottled up. There was, an, there was even a suggestion that this power, and particularly its benevolent aspect, was in some way dependent on being bottled up. According to one account, the main ritual goal of, this, of the king was to seek blessings for his people, healthy, fertility, prosperity from the original law, lawgiver, a being, a being who is in his life, who is, who in his lifetime was so terrifying and destructive that he eventually agreed to be, to be turned into a stone statue and hidden in a temple where no one would see him. In a similar way, the king was sacred and could be and could be a conduit for such blessings, especially precisely in so far as he could be a content. The Natchez case illustrates with unusual clarity a more general principle whereby the contentment of kings become one of the keys to the ritual power. Sovereignty always sovereignty always represents itself as a symbolic break with the moral order this is why kings so often commit some some kind of outrage to establish themselves massacring their brothers marrying their, their sisters desecrating the bonds of their ancestors or in some documented cases literally standing outside their palace and gunning down random prisoners bay yet that very act established the king as potential lawmaker and high tribunal. In much the same way, the high gods are so often represented as broad throwing random bolts of lightning and sending in judgment over the moral acts of human beings. People have an unfortunate tendency to see the successful prosecution of arbitrary violence as in some sense to define or at least to identify it it's some kind of a transcendental power. We might not fall on our knees before any tug or bully or, bu or bully who manages to wake her walk with impunity, at with impunity at least if he isn't actually in the room. But in so far as, so, uh, as such a figure does manage to establish themselves as genuinely standing above the law. In other words, a circuit or set apart, another parallel universal principles kick universal principle kicks in. In order to keep him apart from the muck and mire of ordinary human life, the same video becomes surrounded with restrictions. Violent men generally insist on tokens of respect, but tokens of respect taken to the cosmological level, not to touch the earth not to see the sun tend to become several limits on one's freedom to act violently or indeed in most other ways. For most of history, this was the internal dynamic of sovereignty. Rulers would try to establish the arbitrary nature of their, of their power 
the subjects in so far as they were not simply avoiding the kings entirely, would try to surround the godly personages of the of those rulers with an endless mess of ritual restrictions, so elaborate that the rulers end up effectively imprisoned in their palace, in their palaces. Or even, as in some of the cases of divine kingship, first met from most by Sir James Quasars, the Golden Bow, facing ritual death themselves. So far then, we have seen how each of these three principles we began with, violence, knowledge, and charisma, could in first order regimes become the basis of political structures which, in such ways, in some ways, resemble what we think of as state, but in others, clearly not, clearly don't. None could, in any sense, be described as egalitarian societies. They were all organized around a, fl a very clearly demarcated elite, but at the same time, it's, all, it's not at all clear how well the existence of such elites restricted to the basic freedoms we described in earlier chapters. There is little reason to believe, for instance, that such regimes did not much to impair freedom of movement, not just, not just subjects, seemed to have as little opposition if they choose simply to move away from the proximity of their son, which they generally did. Neither do they find any clear sense of the giving or taking of orders, except in the sovereign's immediate and decidedly limited ambit. Another instructive case of sovereignty without the state is found through the recent history of South Sudan among the Siluk and Nilotic people living alongside the Nuer. To recap, the, the early 20th century, Nuer was a pastoral society of the sort of the of the sort of them referred to in the anthropological literature as egalitarian, to not, in fact, entirely so, because of the extreme distance, distance of, of any situation that might even suggest the giving and striking of orders. The Siluk speak, a Western didotic language, closely related to Noel, and most believe that, at some point in the past, they were one people. While the newer occupied lands best fit for the cattle grazing, the Siluk found themselves living along a fertile stretch of the White Nile, which allowed them to grow the local grain known as, as Duga and support dense populations. However, the Siluk, unlike the Nuer, had a king known as, known as the Red. The Siluk monarch could also be seen as embodying sovereignty in the row in much the same way of the as the nature's as the nature's great son. But the great son and the Sidu great could act with total impunity, but only towards those in their immediate presence. It normally resided in an isolated capital where he conducted regular rituals to guarantee fertility and well being, according to one Italian missionary writing in the early 20th century. The rat lives isolated, as a rule, with some of his wives in the small but famous hill village of Pakuda, now known as Pasuda. His, his, his person is sacred and can be approached only with differently by ordinary people and only with elaborate etiquette by the higher class. His appearance among the people as for journey is rare and awe -inspir inspiring so that most people used to go into hiding or keep out hi of his pet, girls especially do so. The latter presumably for fear of being snatched up snatched up and carried off to the royal harem. Yet to be a royal wife was not without advantages, as the college of royal wives was effectively was substituted for administration, maintaining connections between Fasuda and their natal villages, and it was powerful enough 
if the wives came to consensus in order the king's execution. Then again, the wrath also had his had his henchmen. Often this work upon criminals, runaways, and other unattached persons who would gravitate to him. If the king attempted attempted to mediate a local dispute and only and one party refused to comply, he would occasionally throw in his lot with the other side, raid the offending village, and carry off what the cat, what cat and other things of value of his of value his men could get their hands on. The royal treasury thus consists almost entirely of wealth that had been stolen, plundered in raids or of foreigners, or on the king's own subjects. All this might seem all this might seem a pretty poor model for a free society, but in fact in everyday affairs ordinary sea look appear to have maintained to the same fiercely independent attitude as Newark, and to have been just as averse to taking orders. Even the members of the higher class, basically descendants of earlier kings, could expect only a few gestures of defense, certainly not obedience. An old Siluk legend, an old Siluk legend, sums it nicely. There was once a cruel king who killed many of his subjects. He even killed women. His subjects were terrified of him. One day, to demonstrate that his subjects were so afraid they would do anything he asked, he assembled the Siluk chiefs and ordered them to wall him up inside the house with a young girl. When he then, he ordered them to let him out again. They didn't, so he died. If such oral traditions are anything to go on, Siluk appear to have made a conscious choice that the sporadic the appearance of an arbitrary and sometimes violent sovereign was preferable to any gentle but more systematic method of rule. Whenever a rat attempted, uh, attempted to set up an administrative apparatus, even if only to collect tribute from defeated peoples. His actions were met with overwhelming waves of popular protest that either forced to him, that either forced him to abandon the project or ousted him entirely. Unlike the Siluk Red, Chavin and all the elites were able to mobilize enormous amounts of labor, of labor, but it, but it's not at all clear if they didn't so. If they did so, true change of command, as we've seen in ancient Mesopotamia, coffee or periodic labor service could also be a festive, public spirited, even 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 leavening occasion. And as we shall see, and we shall see, in the case of ancient Egypt, the most authoritarian regimes still often ensured it continued to have something of the same spirit. Lastly, then, we should consider the impact of such first order regimes on our third basic form of freedom. The freedom the freedoms to shift and renegotiate re re social relations either recessionally or permanently. This is of the course this is of course the hardest to assist. Certainly most of these uniforms of power had a decide had a decidedly seasonal element. During certain times of year, as with the makers of Stonehenge, the entire social apparatus of authority would dissolve away and effectively cease to exist. What seems most difficult to comprehend is how the seemingly new institutional arrangements and the physical infrastructure that sustain them came into being in the first place. Who came up? With the design for the labyrinth temple of Chavin de la Juanta, or the royal compounds of Lavenda in Sova, as they were collectively conceived, as they, ha as they may well have been such grand, fa such grand fabrications 
my maiden should be considered be extraordinary be considered extraordinary exercises in human freedom none of this none of these first of the regimes could be considered examples of state formation few no few now would even claim they were so let's turn instead to what of the only cases that pretty much everyone agrees can be considered a state and which has a, and which has served in many ways as a paradigm for all subsequent sets ancient Egypt. How caring labor, ritual, ki ritual killing and tiny bubbles all came together in the origins of the ancient Egypt. If we had no written accounts, accounts to go by, but only the archaeological remains of the natures, would we have any way of knowing that a figure like the great sun even existed in nature society? Conceivably not. We would know that there were some some fairly large ones in the great village, built up in fragile stages, and no doubt post holes would provide evidence for some less wooden structures built on them. Inside those inside those structures, a number of huts give few spits its created artifacts will undoubtedly point to some of the activities that were on that went on there. Perhaps the only compelling evidence of, of kingship too will come in the form of warriors of richly decorated bodies surrounded by sacrificed retainers. If that is archaeologists happen to locate to locate them for some readers, the idea of a dead monarch sent off to the act of afterlife amid the corpses of his retainers might evoke images of early pharaohs, some of Egypt's earliest known kings. Those of the first dynasty around 300-3000 BC, who in fact were not, were not yet referred to as pharaoh, were indeed buried in this way. But Egypt is not alone in this respect. Burial of kings surrounded by dozens, hundreds, or on some occasions even thousands of human victims killed, especially for the occasion, can be found in almost every part of the world when, monarch when monarchies did eventually establish themselves. For the early dynastic cities, state of Ur in Mesopotamia. To the Kerma Polity politi in Nubia to Sang China. There are also there are also credible literary descriptions from Korea, Tibet, Japan, and the Russian steppes. steps. Some something similar seems to have occurred as well in the in the Moche and Wari societies of South America, in the in the Mississippi city of Cahokia. We might do well to think a bit more about these muscles and these masculines because most archaeologists now treat them as one of the more reliable indications that the process of state formation was indeed un underway, underway. The following they follow a surprising consistent pattern. Almost invariably they mark the they mark the first few generations of the founding of a new empire kingdom, often being imitated by rivals in other elite households. Then, the practice gradually fades away, though sometimes surviving in very alternate fashions, as in Sati or Widow, she sits among Raji Satria, warrior case families, warrior case families in much of South Asia in the initial moment. The practice of ritual killing around a royal burial tends to be spectacular, almost as if the death of a ruler meant a brief moment when the sovereignty broke free of its ritual factors, triggering a kind of political supernova that annihilates everything in its path, including some of the highest and mightiest individuals in the kingdom. Then, in that moment, Close members of the royal family, high-ranking military officers and government officials are counted among the victims. Of course, if looking at a burial without written records, it's often hard to tell when we're, when we're dealing 
with the bodies of royal wives, physicians, or court musicians, as opposed to those of royal captives, slaves, or commanders, says randomly on the road. On the road, as we know, was sometimes done in Buganda or Benin, or even in Thai military units, as was sometimes the case the case in China. Perhaps, indeed, the individuals named as kings and queens in the famous royal towns of, of Ur were not really that at all, but just helpless victims, substitute figures, or maybe high-ranking priests and priestesses dressed up as royalty. Even if some cases were just a, a particularly bloody form of custom, dra of custom drama, others others clearly weren't. So the question remains, why did early kingdoms ever do this sort of things of thing at all? And why they this and why did they stop doing it once their power became more established? At the Sun Capital of Anyang, on the central Chinese plain, rulers the rulers tended to make their way on into the afterlife accompanied by a few important retainers who went voluntarily if not always happily, to their deaths and were interred with due honors. With due honors. These were only a common proportion of the bodies that went with them. It was also a royal prerogative to have one's thumb surrounded by the bodies of sacrificial victims. Often, these appeared to be war captives taken from rival lineages and, unlike the retainers, their bodies were systematically mutila mutilated, usually in mocking rearrangements of the victim's head. For the song, this seems to have been a way of denying the victims in, po in the possibility, the, victim, the victims the possibility of becoming the Nazi ancestors, thereby rendering the living members of their lineage unable to take part in the care of and feeding of their own dead kin. Ordinarily, one of the fundamental duties of family life. Case adrift and socially scared, the survivors were more likely to fall under the sway of the strong god. The, rule, the ruler became a greater ancestor, in effect, by preventing others from becoming ancestor at all, ancestors at all. It's interesting to bear, this, to bear this in mind when we turn to Egypt because on the surface that we what we observe in the earliest dynasties, dynasties seems the exact opposite. The first Egyptian kings, and at least one queen, are indeed buried surrounded by sacrificial victims, but those victims seem to have been drawn almost exclusively from their own inner circles. Our evidence for this derives from a series of 5,000 years, 5, years old burial chambers looted in antiquity but still visible near the site of the ancient city by Abydos in the lower desert of southern Egypt. These were the these were the tombs of Egypt's first dynasty. Around its royal tomb lie long rows of subsidiary burials numbering in the hundreds forming a kind of perimeter. Such returner burials, including royal attendants at Cortes, killed in the prime of life were placed in smaller brick compartments of their own, each marked with a gravestone inscribed with the individual's official titles. There do not appear to be any dead relatives or enemies among the buried. On the death of a king, then his successor appears to have presided, presided instead over the death of his predecessor's courtly entourage or at least a sizable portion of it. So, why all this ritual killing at the birth of the Egyptian state? What was the actual purpose of subsidiary burials? Was it to protect the dead king from the living or the living from the dead king? Why did those, why did those sacrifices include, include so many who had evidently, evidently spent their lives caring for the king, most likely including wives, Guards, officials, cooks, grooms, entertainers, palace dwarfs, and other servants, grouped by rank around the royal town according to the roles of occupation. There is a terrible paradox here. 
on the, on the one hand, that we have a ritual that appears to be the ultimate expression of, lo of love and devotion as those who on a day-to-day -day basis mod the king into something king-like, fed him, clothed him, trimmed his hair, cared for him in sickness and kept him company when they was lonely while waiting to their deaths and sure to ensure he would continue to be to be key, to be in the after afterlife at the same time they, these burias are ultimate demonstration that for a ruler even his most intimate subjects could be treated as personal possessions casually disposed of like so many blankets gaming boards or jugs of spe of spell many have speculated about what it all means like as may likely as not five thousand years ago many of those laying out the bodies wondered too written records of the time don't give don't give us much sense of the official motives but of the things that quite striking in the evidence we do have largely a list of a list of names and titles is the very mixed composition of these royal cemeteries. They seems they seem to include both in both blood relatives of the early kings and queens, notably for some female members of the royal family and a good member of other individuals who were taken in as members of the royal household owing to their individual skills of, stri of striking personal qualities and who does who thus came to be seen as members of the king's extended family the violence and shedding of blood that attended this mass funerary, funerary, funerary rituals must have must have gone some way to efface to effacing those references melding them into a single unit turning servants into relatives and relatives into servants in later times the kings in the, in the later times, the king's close kin represented themselves in exactly this way by placing in their tombs some humble replicas of themselves engaged in acts in acts of menial labor, such as grinding grain or cooking meals. When sovereignty first expands to become the general organizing organizing principle of society, it is by turning violence into kinship. The early the early spectacular face of, of mass of mass killing in both china and egypt whatever else it may be doing appears to be intended to lay the foundations of what of what Marx Weber referred to as a patrimonial system that is one in which one in which all the king's subjects are imagined as members of the royal household at least to the degree that they are all working to care for the king Turning as well, turning as well, strangers into part of the royal household, or denying them their own ancestors, are thereby ultimately two sides of the same coin. Or to put things another, or, or to put things another way, a ritual designed to produce kinship becomes a method of producing kings, kingship. These extreme forms of ritual, this extreme. These extreme forms of ritual killing around royal burials ended fairly abruptly in the course of Egypt's, Egypt's second dynasty. However, the patrimonial polity continued to expand not so much in the sense of expanding Egypt's eternal borders, which were established early on though was what outward violence directed at the neighbors in Nubia and elsewhere, but more in terms of saving the lives of its eternal subjects. Within a few generations, we feel we find the valley and delta of Nile divided into the royal estates is dedicated to provisioning the mortuary cults of the different former rulers, and not long after that, the foundation of entire workers' town, workers' towns devoted to the construction of the pyramids on the, on the Giza plateau, drawing coffee, lab, coffee labor from up and down the country. At this point, with the construction of the Great Pyramids at Giza, surely no one could deny that we are in the presence of some sort of state, but the pyramids, of course, we are so tombs, 
in the case of Egypt, it seems, state formation began with some kind of natures of silo like principle of individual sovereignty, bursting out of its ritual church precisely through the vehicle of sovereign's demise in such a way that royal death, uh, that royal death ultimately became the basis for re reorganizing much of human life along the length of Nile. Along the length of the Nile. To understand how this could happen, we need to look at what Egypt was like be well before the first dynasty tombs at Abydos. Before we consider what happened in the centuries directly preceding Egypt's first dynasty, the so-called pre-dynastic and proto-dynastic periods from around 4000 to 3100 BC, it is worth testing our minds back to an even earlier phase of racial history in the same region. Let's recall that the African Neolithic, including that, including that of the Nile Valley, Egyptian and Sudanese, that took a different to a different form to a different form to that of the Middle East in the fifth millennium BC. There was less of an emphasis on cereal agriculture and more on cattle along with the wide variety of wild and cultivated food sources typical of the period. Perhaps the best modern comparison we have to its very far for exact is with Neolithic people is with Neolithic peoples like the Nuer, Dinka, Siluk, or Anwak, who grow crops but think of themselves as pastoralists, shifting back and forth each season between camps improvised for the occasion. If we might hazard a very broad generalization, work in the Middle Eastern Neolithic, the further question, the cultural focus in the sense of decorative arts, care and attention, was on horses. In Africa, it was on bodies. From very early on, from very early on, we have burials with be beautiful work objects of a box of personal grooming and highly elaborate sets of body ornamentation. It's no it's no coincidence that many centuries later, when the Egyptian first dynasty took form, among the very first objects, among the very first objects. With royal inscriptions, we find the ivory comb of King Jet, and the fabulous palette of King Narmer. Stone palettes being used, bought by men and women for grinding and mixing make up. These are basically spectacular reflections of the sort of objects Neolithic Niles dwellers used to beautify themselves millennia early, and not coincidentally, to offer as gifts to the ancient ancestral dead. In Neolithic and pre dynastic times, such objects were widely available to women, men, and children. In fact, from those very early times in Neolithic society, the human body itself became a sort of monument. Experiments with techniques of mummification took place long before the first dynasty. As early as the Neolithic period, Egyptians were already mixing aromatics and preservative oils to produce bodies that could that could last forever and whose places of burial were to f were the the fixed points of reference in an early shifting social landscape. How then do we get from do we get from a such remarkably fluid fluid state of affairs to the spectacular appearance of the first dynasty almost two thousand years later? Territorial kingdoms don't come out of nowhere. Until quite recently, we, we had little more than fragmentary hints of what of what must have been happening during what are technically referred to as the pre dynasty and proto dynasty periods, that is, roughly the fourth millennium before King Number appears around 3100 3, 3, BC. In such cases, it is tempting to refer to analogies with more recent situations. As we've seen, modern Neolithic peoples, and particularly the Silo, saw how relatively mobile, soci mobile societies that place great value on individual freedom of mind, nonetheless prefer an arbitrary spot who could, eventually to, who could eventually be got rid of to any more, to any more systematic or pervasive form of rule.
This is especially true if, like so many peoples, so why whose ancestors organize in organize their lives around livestock, they tend to work patriarchal forms of organization. Who one could imagine the prehistoric Nile are fairly as dominated by a collection of silk like rats. Each with their own settlement, which was essentially an extended patriarchal family, be carrying a feeling with one another, but otherwise, as yet, making very little difference to the lips of those who, of those over whom they, ostensi they, they ostensibly ruled. Still, there is no substitute for actual archaeological evidence, and in recent years, it has been building up a pace. New discoveries show that new discoveries show that by no later than 3,500 BC, and so still some of the five centuries before the first dynasty, we do indeed find burials of petty monarchs at various locations throughout the, the valley of the Nile and also down into Nubia. We don't know any of their names since writing had barely developed yet. Most of the kingdoms appear to have been extremely small. The largest we know of centered on Nakada and Abydos near the great bend of the Nile in Upper Egypt on Hierakonpolis further to the south and on the side of Kustul in Lower Nubia but even those do not seem to have controlled extensive territories. What preceded, what preceded the first dynasty then was not so much of lack of sovereign power as, super, as, as a superfluity of it and a surfeit of tiny kingdoms and miniature cuts always with a call of blood relatives and motley collection of henchmen, wives, servants and the certain hangs out, hangers on. Some of these uh, some of these gods appear to have been quite magnificent in their own way, leaving behind large tombs and the bodies of sacrificed retain retainers. The most spectacular at Hira Hirakonpolis includes not only a male dwarf that seemed to have become a fixed of godly society very very early on, but a significant number of teenage girls and what seemed to be the remains of a private zoo, a menagerie of exotic animals including two baboons and an, and an African elephant. These kings give every sign of making grandiose, absolute cosmological claims, but little sign of maintaining administrative or military control over their respective territories. How do we get from here to the massive agrarian bureaucracy of later? dynastic times in Egypt, part of the answer lies in, the, in a parallel process of change that archaeology also allows us to untangle. Around the middle of the 4th millennium BC, we might imagine it as a kind of extended argument or debate about the responsibilities of the living to the dead. Do dead kings, like live ones, still need us to take care of them? Is this care different from the care according to according ordinary ancestors? Do ancestors get hungry? And if so, what exactly do they eat? For whatever reasons, the answer that can present across the Nile Valley around 3500 BC was that ancestors too indeed get hungry, and what they required was something which, at that time, can only have been considered a, a rather exotic and perhaps luxurious form, form of food, leaven bed, and fermented wood bed beer. The pot containers for which now start to become standard fixtures of well appointed graph assemblages. It is no coincidence that a rebel wet farming to long familiar in the valley and delta of Nile was only refined and intensi intensified around this time at least partly in response to the to the new demands of the dead. The two processes, agronomic and ceremonial, were mutually reinforcing, and the social effects epochal, in effect, they led the creation of what might be 
considered the world's first first century and in so many parts of the world initially followed by neolithic populations the periodic flooding of the Nile had, had a first made had a first made permanent division of lands difficult quite likely it was not ecological circumstances but the social requirement to provide bread and beer and beer on several occasions that allowed such divisions to become in, entrenched, entrenched. This was not just this was not just a matter of access to sufficient quantities of arable land, but also the means to maintain the, to maintain blocks of an oxen. Another introduction of the late fourth millennium machine families who found themselves unable to command such resources had to obtain beer and loaves as well creating networks of obligation and debt. Hence, imp hence important class distinctions hence important class distinctions and dependencies did in fact begin to emerge as a sizable sector of Egypt popul Egypt's population found itself deprived on the means to care independently for gestures. If any of this if any of this seems fanciful we need only compare what happened with the extension of Inca sovereignty in Peru. Here, too, we find a contrast between the traditional varied and flexible regime of the every, of everyday foodstuffs. In this case, sentry on season made from fish dried potatoes chuño, and the introduction of a completely different sort of food, in this case, mesh beer or chicha, which was considered fit for the gods and also gradually became, as it were, the flood of empire. By the time of the Spanish conquest, mess was a ritual necessity for rich and poor alike. Gods and royal mummies dined on it, Arabs marched on it, and those too poor to grow it or who lived to high up on, on the altiplano had to find other, other ways of obtaining it often ending up in debt to the royal estates as a result. In the case of Peru, we have the Spanish chronicles to help, to help us understand how an intoxicant could gradually become the lifeblood of an empire. In Egypt, 5,000 years ago, we can really only guess at the details. It's a remarkable tribute to the discipline of archaeology, and we know as much as we do and we are starting to put the pieces together. For instance, it's around 3,500 3, BC that we begin to find remains of facilities used to use for both baking and weaving, first alongside cemeteries. And within the few centuries attached to places to palaces and grand tombs, a later depiction from the tomb of an official called the source how they could have operated with pork baked with pork baked bread and baked produce by a single process, the gradual extension of royal authority and also administrative reach. Throughout Egypt began around the time of the first dynasty or a little before, with the creation of estates ostensibly dedicated to organizing the provisions, not so much of living kings of the dead ones and eventually did royal official too. By the time of the of the Great Pyramids circa 2500 BC, bread and beer were being manufactured on an industrial scale to supply armies of workers during the session of service on royal construction projects when they when they too good when they too got to be relatives or at least caregivers givers of the king and as such were at this temporarily were proficient and well cared for. The workers, the workers down at Giza produced some, some, thousand, some thousands of ceramic molds. These were used to make the huge communal loaves known as bread, eaten in large groups with copious, with copious amounts of meat supplied by royal livestock pens and washed down with, spied, with spiced beer. The latter was the, the latter was of severe importance of the solidarity so, solidarity of seasonal work work used in old kingdom Egypt. The fact emerged with 
is some in simplicity from graffiti on the on the reverse sides of building blocks used in the construction of royal pyramids. Fresh of the kingdom Menkore's Menkore, read one such blank cuts of Menkore another. This is in a works this is in a work units of these files as Egyptologists call them seem to have been made up only of men who passed through special age great rituals and who modeled themselves on the organization of a board school where the such ritual board brotherhoods ever took to their water together isn't clear but there are notable parallels parallels between the team skill between the team skills used in the maritime engineering and those used in manipulating multi-ton blocks of limestone and granite for royal pyramid temples or other such monuments. There may be interesting parallels to explore here with what happened in the industrial revolution when techniques of the discipline transforming or transforming crews of people into clock lines into clock like -like, clock like machines were first pioneered on sailing ships and only later transferred to the factory floor. Where ancient Egyptian where ancient Egyptian boat crews, the model for what have been called the world's first production line techniques, creating fast monuments, far more impressive than anything the world had yet seen by by dividing tax into an endless variety of simple mechanical components, cutting, dragging, hoisting, polishing. This is how the pyramids were actually built, by rendering subjects into great social machines, afterwards celebrates, celebrated by mass confici, conviviality. We have just described, in broad outline, what's widely treated as the world's worst now an example of state formation. It would be easy to go on from here to generalize. Perhaps this is what the state actually is, a combination of exceptional violence and the creation of a complex social machine, all ostensibly devoted to acts of care and devotion. There is obviously a paradox here. Caring level is in a way the very opposite of mechanical level. It is about recognizing and understanding the unique qualities, needs, and peculiarities of the cat, for whether child, adult, animal, or plant, in order to provide what they require to flourish. Caring level is distinguished by its particularity. If those institutions we today refer to as states really do have any common features, one must certainly be a, be a tendency to decide to, to displace this care impulse on two abstractions today today this is unusual this is usually the nation however broadly or narrowly defined perhaps this is why it's so easy for us to see ancient egypt as a prototype for the modern state here too popular devotion was uh, was diverted on to great abstractions, in this case the ruler and the elite dead. This, the, this process is what made it possible for the whole arrangement to be imagined simultaneously as a, as a family and a machine in which everyone, except of course the king, was ultimately interchangeable. For the social work of tomb building to the daily surfacing of the ruler's body, equal again how the first royal inscriptions are found in concombs and meta pellets, most of human activity was directed upwards, either towards tending rulers, life and death, or assisting them with their own tasks of feeding and caring for the gods. All this activity was seen as generating, generating a downward flow of divine blessings and protection, which occasionally, which occasionally took a ma took material form in the good faith of the workers' towns. The problems come when we try to take this paradigm and apply it almost anywhere else. Two, as we've noted, between Egypt and Peru, all the more remarkable, considering the strikingly different topographies, the flat and easily navig navigable Nile, 
as against the vertical archipelagos of the Andes. These parallels appear in arcane details like the mummification of dead rulers and the way in which such mummified rulers continue to maintain their own rural estates, the way living kings as treated as God, as treat, treat as gods who have made who have to make various stores of of their dominance of their nomins. What society what societies to what societies to set a certain antipathy to urban life. The capitals were really ceremonial and centers stages for royal display with relatively few permanent residents and the ruling and, and the ruling elite preferred to imagine their subjects as living in real of bucolic estates and hunting grounds, but all the, but all this only served to underline the degree to which other cases referred to in the literature as early states were entirely different, in which we reflect on the difference between differences between what are usually called early states from China to Mesoamerica. The Kingdom of Egypt and the Inca Empire demonstrate what can happen when the principle of sovereignty arms itself with a bureaucracy and manage, manages to extend itself uniformly across, to, across a territory. As a result, they are very often invoked as primordial examples of state formation even though they are dramatically specific right in time and space. Almost none of the of the other canonical early states appear to have taken this approach. Early dynasty Mesopotamia, for instance, was made up of dozens of city states of varying sizes, even governed by its own charisma, by its own charismatic warrior king, whose special individual qualities were said to be to be recognized by the gods and physically marked in the outstanding virility and allure of his body, all fighting constantly for dominance. Only occasionally would one ruler gain enough of an upper hand to create something that might be described as the beginnings of, the, of a unified kingdom of empire. It's not clear whether any of these early Mesopotamian rulers actually claimed sovereignty, at least in the absolute sense of standing outside of the moral order and thus being able to work with impunity or to create entirely new society, so new social forms of their own volition. The cities, the, the cities they ostensibly ruled over had been around for centuries commercial hubs with strong traditions of self-governance, each with its own cities, got city gods who preside over local systems of temple administration. King, in this case, almost never claimed to be gods themselves, but rather the gods Fajerans, Fiji, Fajerans, and sometimes heroic defenders on earth, and sought delegates of sovereign power that resided properly in heaven. The result was a dynamic tension between two principles, which, as we've seen, originally arose in opposition to one another. The administrative order of the river, river valleys and the heroic individualistic politics of the surrounding highlands. Sovereignty, in the last resort, belonged to God, belonged to the gods alone. Islands were different again. To be a classic Maya ruler, Ajao, was to be a hunter and got impersonator of the first rank, a warrior whose body, on entering battle or during dance rituals, became host to the spirit of an ancestral hero, deity, or dream-like monst monsters. Ajaos were, effectively, like tiny scrabbling gods. If anything was projected into the cosmos, in the classic Maya case, it was precisely the principle of idiocracy. Most Mayanists would agree that classic period, classic period rulers lack of sophistication like a sophisticated administrative apparatus, but they imagine the cosmos as itself, as itself a kind of administrative hierarchy governed by predictable laws. An intricate of celestial or subterranean wheels within wheels, 
such that it was possible to establish the exact birth and death and death dates of major deities dozens of years in the past the deity muan mat for instance was born on 7 december 3121 bc seven years before the curse of the current universe even if it would never occur to them to register the numbers worth let alone but that but that's of their own subjects so do these early states have any common feature at features at all obviously some basic generalizations can be made all deployed spectacular violence at the pinnacle of, of the system all ultimately depended depended on and to some degree mimic the patriarchal organization of households in every case the apparatus of government stood on top of some kind of division of society into classes but as we have seen in the earlier chapters these elements could just as well exist without our, without our prior to the case of central government and even when such government was established they could take they could take very different forms in mesopotamian cities for instance social class was often based on land tenure and mercantile wealth tempest or tempest doubled as cities as city banks and factories their girls might only live at the temple grounds on festive occasions but priests move in border cycles make interest bearing loans to traders watching over armies of female of female weavers and jealousy guarding their field and their fields and flocks they, these were powerful societies of, of my sons we know much less about such matters in the maya lowlands but we do but what we do now suggests that power was the, the power was based less on the control of land of commerce or commerce than on the ability to control flows of people and loyalty directly through the in, to intermediate and, inten, and the intensely personal bonds that obtain between lords and lesser nobles. Hence, the focus in classic Maya politics on capturing high status tribes in warfare as a form of human capital, something which hardly features in Mesopotamian sources. Looking at China, what looking at China only seems to complicate things even further. In the time of the late Shang, from 1200 to 1000 BC, China society did share certain features with the other canonical early states, but considered as an integrated whole is entirely unique. Like in Kakusko, the Shang capital at Anyang was designed as a pivot of the four characters as cosmological anchor for the entire kingdom, laid out as a grand stage for real royal ritual. But like both Cusco and the Egyptian capital of Memphis and later Thebes, the city was suspended within the words of living and the dead and the dead, serving as home to the royal cemeteries and the and the attached monotory temples as well as living administration. It industrial cutters produce enormous quantities of bronze vessels and jets the tools used in commuting with registers. But in most important ways, we find little similarity between the Shang and either Old Kingdom Egypt or Inca Peru. For one thing, Shang rulers did not come so back into over understand the area. They could travel safely, let alone issue comments. Also, a narrow bed of territories clustered on the middle and lower research and low reaches of the Leo Yellow River not far from the royal court. Even there is that one is left with a sense that they didn't really claim sovereignty in the same sense as Egyptian, Peruvian, or even Mayan rulers. The clearest evidence is the exceptional importance of definition in the early China states, which stands in striking contrast to pretty much all the other examples we've been looking at. Effectively, any royal decisions, any royal decision, whether 
alliance, the founding of new cities, or even such a perfectly trivial matter, or, or even such a perfectly trivial matter as a standing royal hunting grounds, could only proceed if approved by the, ult the ultimate authorities who were the gods and ancestral spirits, and there was no absolute assurance that such a proposal would be forthcoming in any given case. Sang Definers appeal to gods uh, through the medium of burnt offerings. The process was as follows. When hosting gods or ancestors at, ri at a ritual meal, king or their diviners put turtle cells and ox scapula scapulae on the fire, then read the cracks that broke out on the fire on the dead surfaces as a kind of oracular writing. The proceeds were quite well critiqued once. An answer had been obtained, the diviner or an appointed scribe would autograph the reading by etching an inscription on the bone of shell, and the resulting oracle would be stored for later consultant, consult, consultation. This oracle, this oracle text, are the first written inscriptions in China we actually know about, and why it is very possible that writing was used for everyday purposes of perishable media that don't survive, there remains as yet not no, no, as yet no clear evidence for other forms of administrative activity or archive or archives that become so typical or later Chinese de Chinese dynasties, nor much in the way of an elaborate bureaucratic apparatus at all. Like the Maya, Shang rulers routinely wage war to acquire stocks of living human victims for sacrifices. Rival courts to the sun had their own ancestors, sacrifices and diviners, and while then appeared to have recognized the sun as paramount, especially in ritual context, there seemed not there seemed to be not contra no there seemed to be no contradiction between this and actually going to work with them if they felt there was a su there was sufficient cause. Such rivalries help, help, help explain the lavishness of sang funerals and mutilation of captive bodies. The rulers were still in sense playing an anarchic games typical of a hairy society, competing to outside and humiliate the rivals. Such a situation is inherently unstable and eventually one rival dynasty when the, the western zoo did manage definitively to defeat the Shang and claim to itself the mandate of heaven. At this point, it should be clear that what we are really talking about in all these cases is not the birth of state in the sense of emergence, an embryonic form of, an, of, a, new of, of a new and unprecedented institution that will go and evolve into modern forms of government. We are speaking instead of broad regional systems, it just happens. In the case of Egypt and the Andes, the entire regional system becomes united at least some of the time under a single government. This was actually a fairly unusual arrangement. Most common were arrangements such as those in Shang China, Shang China, where unification was largely theoretical, or Mesopotamia, where regional hegemony rarely lasted for the longer than a generation or two. Of the Maya, where there, uh, where there was a protracted struggle between two main power blocks, neither of which could ever quite overcome to other. In terms of the specific theory we've been developing here, where the three elementary forms of domination, control of violence, control of knowledge, and charismatic power, can each crystallize or in can each catalyst into its own institutional form, sovereignty, administration, and heroic politics. Almost all these early states could be more accurately described as second order regimes of domination. First order regimes, like the Olmec, Chefin, or Natchez, each develop only one depart, only one part of the triad. But in the typically far more violent arrangements of second order regimes, 
two of the three principles of domination were brought together in some spectacular unprecedented way. Which to it was which to it which to it was seems to have varied from case to case. Egypt's early rulers combined sovereignty and administration. Mesopotamian kings mixed administration and heroic politics. Classic Maya adjust fused heroic politics with sovereignty. Which emphasis that it's not as it's not as if any of these principles in their elementary forms were entirely absent in any one case. In fact, what seems to have happened to have happened it that two of them crystallized into institutional forms, forcing in such a way, in such a way as to enforce one against one another as the basis of government, while the third form of domination was largely pushed pushed out of the realm of human affairs altogether and and displaced onto the non-human cosmos, as we define sovereignty in early dynastic Mesopotamia or the cosmic bureaucracy of the classic Maya. Keeping all this in mind, return, let's, re, let re, let's return briefly to Egypt to classify, what, to classify some, remaining, some, some remaining points, in which we consider the Egyptian case in light of our three elementary principles of domination and also revisit the problem of Dark Ages. The architects of Egypt's old kingdom clearly saw the world clearly saw the world they were creating as something like a cult temple, red and precious isolation. The vision is vividly documented in relief carvings of stone lining the walls of royal temples, while we have this mot the mortuary cults of kings such as Joseph, Ben Korea, Sneferu, and Sahure. Here, Egypt, the two lands, is always represented as both a celestial theater state, theater state in which king and gods seek equal being and an early domain, a world of rural estates and hunting grounds mapped out in a cartography of copulence. Each parcel of land, of land personified as a lady in waiting who brings her bounty to the feet of the king. The governing principle of this vision of Egypt is the monarch's absolute sovereignty over everything, symbolized in his gigantic funerary monuments. His defiant section that there were nothing he could be, he could not conquer, even that. Egyptian kingship was, however, Janus' face. Its inner visage was that of supreme patriarch. Standing God over a freshly extended family, a great house, the literal meaning of Pharaoh. Its outer face is sound in depictions of the king as war, as a war leader or hand leader, asserting control over the country's wild frontiers, all were fair game when the king turned his violence upon them. This is very different. However, to heroic violence, in a way, it's the opposite. In, her, in a hairy order, the warrior's honor is based on the fact that he might lose. His reputation means so much to him that he is willing to state his life, dignity, and freedom to defend it. Egyptian rulers in these early periods never represent themselves as, a, as hairy figures in this sense. They could not conceivably lose. As a result, wars are not represented as political contests, which imply a mess between politic potential equals. Instead, combat and the, ca and the case uh, and the chase alike were well sections of ownership and less rehearsals of the same sovereignty the king exercised over his people and which ultimately derived from his kinship with the gods. As we've already had occasion to observe, any form of sovereignty at once so absolute and so personal as a pharaoh's will necessarily pose of several problems of delegation. Here, too, all state of seers had to be in some, some sense appendages of the king's own person. 
Major Lendog, Major Lend Owners, Military Commanders, Police Administrators, and other senior government officials, officials also held also held the titles like Keeper of the King's Secrets, Beloved Acquaintance of the King, Director of Music to the Pharaoh, Officer of the Palace Manicurist, Manicurist of Even, or even of the King's Breakfast. We are, we are not suggesting that power games were absent here, nor that there's never been a royal court without jockeying for position, tricks, and double dealing and political intrigue. The point is that these were not public contests, and no sanctioned space existed for open competition. Everything remained confined to live at court, to life at court. This is abundantly clear in the long biographies of our kingdom officials which describe their life achievements almost exclusively in terms of their relationship relationship to and the care of for the king rather than any personal qualities or attainments what we have what we have in this case then seems to be a to be a hypertrophy of the principles of sovereignty and administration and and it, an almost an almost complete absence of competitive politics, dramatic public dramatic public contests of any sort, political or otherwise, were were well nigh non existent. There is nothing in the official sources of the Egyptian old kingdom, nor much in later periods of ancient Egyptian history, that is remotely reminiscent of, say, Roman of say Roman chariot rising of all of supported ball games. In the royal jubilee or set festival, where Egyptian kings read a secret to celebrate the unification of the two lands of Upper and Lower Egypt. It took the form of a solo performance to come to outcome of which was never in doubt. In so far as competitive politics appears in later Egyptian literature, which is occasionally does it takes place precisely within the gods, as in works like the contendings of August and Seth. Dead kings, perhaps, compete with, the, with one another, but the time sovereignty comes, comes down to the domain of mortals, matters have already been settled. Just to be utterly clear about what we, what we are saying here, when we, when we speak of an absence of charismatic politics, we are, talking, we are talking about the absence of a star system or hall of fame with, with institutionalist referees, with the knights, warlords, politicians, and so on. We are most certainly not speaking about an absence of individual personalities. It's just that in pure monarchy, there is only one person, or at best handful of individuals, who really matter. Indeed, if we are trying to understand the appeal of monarchy as a form of government, and it cannot be denied that for much of recorded human history, it was a very popular one, then likely it has something to do with its ability to mobilize sentiments or carry the two and object and an object throughout at the same time. The king is both the ultimate individual, his kicks and fancies always to be indulged like spoiled, spoiled baby and at the same time the ultimate abstraction since its powers over mass violence and often as in egypt mass production can render if you want the same it's also worth observing that monarchy is probably the only prominent system of government we know of we know of in which in which children are crucial players since everything depends on the monarch's ability to continue the dynastic line, the dead can be worshipped under a regime, even the, uni even the United States, which frames itself as a beacon of democracy, creates temples to its founding fathers and carves portraits of dead presidents into the sides of mountains. But in France, pure, object pure objects of love and daughter are not only politically important in kingdoms and empires. If the ancient Egyptian regime is often held out 
as the first to step in the paradigm of for all future ones, it is large it is largely because it was capable for synthesizing absolute sovereignty. The monarch's ability to stand apart from human society and engage in arbitrary violence with impunity, with an administrative apparatus which, at certain moments at least, could reduce almost everyone to cogs in a single great machine. Only heroic competitive politics was lacking, pushed off into the wars of gods and the dead. But there was, of course, a great exception to this which comes precisely in those periods where central authority broke down the supposed dark ages beginning with the first intermediate period, circa 2181 until, 20, until 2055 BC. Already, already towards the end of the Old Kingdom, no marks, no marks or local governors has made had made themselves into de facto dynasties. When the central government split between rival centers at Heracleopolis, Heracleopolis and Thebes, such local leaders began to take over most functions of government. Often referred to as warlords, these, mona these nomarchs were in fact nothing like the petty kings of the pre-dynasty pre period, at least in their own monuments. They represent themselves as something closer to the to popular heroes, even saints. Neither, neither was this or neither was this always just idle boasting. Somewhere, somewhere indeed referred as saints for centuries to come. No doubt, charismatic local leaders had always existed in Egypt, but with the brief breakdown of the patrimonial state, such figures could begin to make open claims of authority based on their personal achievements and attributes, bravery, generosity, oratory, oratorical, and strategic, and strategic skills, and, crucially, redefine social authority itself as based on qualities of public, of public service and pity to the gods of their local town and the popular support those qualities inspired. In other words, whenever the state sovereignty broke down, hairy politics returned with charismatic figures just as fine, glorious, and competitive, perhaps as those we know from ancient epics, but far less bloodthirsty. But, but bloodthirsty. The change is clearly, the change is clearly visible in autobiographical inscriptions, like those in the rock cut in the rock cut tomb of the if the nomad and in Nomak Ang TV at El Moala, south of Tebes. Here's how we how he narrates his, his role in work. I was one who found the solution when, when it was lacking, thanks to my figure's friends. One with commanding words and untroubled mind on the day when the norm the norms administered territories are led together to West War. I'm the hero without equal. One who spoke freely while people were silent on the day when fear was paid and Abu Egypt did not dare to speak. Even more striking, here's how, the here's how he celebrates his social achievements. I gave bread to the hungry and clothing to the neck. I, I anointed those who had, no, who had no cosmetic oil. I gave sandals to the barefooted. I gave a wife to him who had no wife. I took care of the town of Hefat or El Mumala and Hormer in every crisis when the sky was clouded and the earth was passed and people died of hunger, hunger on the sand book of Apopis. This sound, this, the south came with its people and the north with its children. They brought France oil in exchange for barley which was given to them. All of Upper Egypt was dying of hunger, and people were eating the children, but I did not allow anybody to die of hunger in this norm. Never, ne never, I, never did I allow an anybody in need to go from this norm to another one. I am the hero without equal. It's only at this point, in the first intermediate period, that we see a hereditary aristocracy coming into its own in Egypt as local 
maanet manatets like an activity they can begin transferring their powers to their offspring and extended families aristocracy and personal politics had no such recognized place in the old kingdom precisely because they came into conflict with the principle of sovereignty in summary the transition from old kingdom to the first intermediate period was not so much a shift from order to chaos or as egyptological orthodoxy once had it as a swing from sovereignty and to, to charismatic politics as different ways of framing the exercise of power with with that with that came a shift in emphasis from the people's care of god like rulers to the care of people to the care of the people as a legitimate path to authority in ancient egypt as southern in history significant politics significant political accomplishments occur in precisely those periods the so-called dark ages that get dismissed or overlooked because no one was building grandiose monuments in stone in which we go in search of the real origins of bureaucracy and find them on what appears to be a surprisingly small scale at this point it should be easy it should be easy enough to understand why ancient egypt is so regularly held out as the paradigmatic example of state formation it's not just that it is chronologically the earliest of the earliest of what we have called second order regimes of domination aside from the much later in Kai empire it's also just about on the, the only case when the two principles that came is together were sovereignty and administration in other words it's the only case from a suitably distant phase of history that perfectly fits the, the perfectly fits of the, the model of what should have what should have happened all such assumptions really go back to a certain kind of social theory or maybe later put a theory of organization that we get described as at the start of chapter 8 small intimate groups the argument goes might be able to adopt informal egalitarian means of problem solving but as soon as large numbers of people are assembled together in the city of a kingdom of a kingdom everything changes simply assume in this kind of theory that one society scale up the will need as robin dunberg puts it seems to direct and a police force to ensure that social rules are adhered to or so as jared diamond says large populations can function without leaders who make the decisions executives who carry out the decisions and bureaucrats who administer the decision deci deci decisions of and laws in other words if you want to live in a large in a large scale society you need a sovereign and an administration it is more or less taken for granted that some kind of monopoly of coercive box again the ability of treating everyone with weapons is ultimately required in order to do this writing systems in turn are almost invariably assumed to have developed in service of impersonal bureaucratic systems impersonal bureaucratic states which were the result of the whole process now as we've already seen none of this is really true and predictions based on these assumptions are most invariably to be turned out to be wrong we saw one dramatic example in chapter 8 it was widely assumed that if we occurred states tend to rise in areas with complex irrigation systems it must have been because of the need for administrators to coordinate the maintenance of canals and regulate the water supply in fact in third it turns out that the farmers are perfectly capable of coordinating very complicated irrigation systems all by themselves and there's little evidence in most cases the early bureaucrats had anything to do with such matters urban populations seem to have a remarkable capacity for self-governance in way which were usually not quite egalitarian were likely a good deal more participatory than almost any urban government today 
Meanwhile, most ancient emperors, as it turns out, so little reasons, so little reason to interfere, as they simply didn't care very much about how their subjects split the streets or maintain their religious ditches. We've also observed that when early regimes do base their domination on executive exclusive access to forms of knowledge. These are these are often not two kinds, not the kinds of knowledge of we ourselves co would consider particularly practical the shamanic psychotropic revelations that seem to have inspired the builder, the builders of Chevin de Quanta would be one such example. In fact, the first form the, the first form of functional administrator in the sense of keeping us archives of lists, ledgers, accounting, procedures, overseas, audits, and files seem to, to emerge in precisely these kinds of ritual context in Mesopotamian temples, Egyptian and Chester cults, Chinese oracle readings, and so on. So, one thing we can now say with a fair degree of certainty is that bureaucracy did not begin simply as a practical solution to problems of information in management when human societies advance beyond a particular threshold of, of scale and complexity. This, however, raises an raises the interesting question of where and when such technologies did first arise, and for what reason, there's here there's some surprising new evidence too. Our, our emerging archaeological understanding suggests that the first systems of specialist administrative control actually emerged in very small communities. The earliest, the earliest clear evidence of this appears in a series of tiny prehistoric settlements in the Middle East dating over 1,000 years after the Neolithic site of Shatal Khoyuk was founded at around 700-7400 BC, but still more than 2,000 years before the appearance of anything even virtually resembling a city. The best example of such a site is Tel Sabi Abyad, investigated by a team of Dutch archaeologists working in Syria's Balikh Valley in the province of Raqqa around 8,000 years ago, circa 6,200 6, BC, in what was prehistoric Mesopotamia, a one-hectare village was destroyed there by fire, making its mud and making its mud walls and many of the decaying contents, thus preserving him. While obviously a very bad bit of luck of the inhabitants, it was a store of brilliant luck for further researchers, since it has left us a unique insight to the, to the organization of a Neolithic community comprising perhaps around 150 individuals. What the excavators discovered is that, uh, is that not only did the inhabitants of this village erect central storage facilities and cooling granaries and warehouses, they also employ administrative devices of some complexity to keep track of what of what was in them. These devices include economic archives, which were miniature precursors to the temple archives at Uruk and other later Mesopotamian cities. These were not writer archives, writing as such will not appear for another 3,000 years. What the exists were geometric tokens made of clay, a sort, of, a sort that appear to have been in many similar Neolithic villages, most likely to keep track of the allocation of particular resources. A tells of Yabiyat, to seals, being engraved, as, being engraved designs were used alongside them, were used, were used alongside them to stack and mark the clutch topics at, of household vessels by identifying signs. Perhaps, most remarkably, the stopper themselves, once removed from the vessels, 
were keeping an archive, an archive in a special building, an office of weary of sorts near the center of the village for later reference. Ever since this discovery were reported in 1990s, archaeologists have been debating in whose interest and for what purpose such various bureaucracies functioned. In trying to answer this question, it's important to note that the central bureau and depot of the Sabi Apiat is not associated with any kind of unusually large residence, which burials or other signs of personal status. If anything, what's strikingly about the remainings of this community is their uniformity, their surrounding dwellings, for instance, are all roughly equal in size, quality, and surviving contents. The contents themselves suggest small family, family units which maintain a complex division of labor, often including tasks that would have required that cooperation of multiple households. Flocks had to be passed through. A, a variety of cereal crops sound, harvested and threshed, as well as flax for weaving, which was practiced alongside other household crafts, such as potting, meat making, stone carving, and simple forms of metal working. And of course, there were children to raise, old people to care of, to care for, house, houses to build and maintain, barriers and funerals to coordinate, and so on. Careful scheduling and mutual aid would have been vital for the successful completion of an annual round of productive activities, while evidence of obsidian, metals, and exotic pigments indicates the villagers also interacted regularly with outsiders, no doubt to intermediaries as well as travel and trade. As we've already observed, to the case in of traditional bus villages. These sorts of activity could were involved quite complicated quite complicated mathematical calculations. Still, this is in itself this in its this in itself does not explain why there was a need to fall back and precise and precise systems of measurement and archiving. After all, there are untold thousand there are under thousands of agricultural communities across human history with just similarity complex combinations of tasks and responsibilities without having to create new techniques of record keeping. Reason, the effect of introducing such techniques seems to have been performed for villages in prehistoric Mesopotamia and the surrounding hill, hill country. Recall that. 20,000 years separate Tel Sabi appeared from the earliest cities and during that long span of time village life in the Middle East underwent a series of remarkable underchange of remarkable changes. In some ways, people living in small scale communities began to act as if they were already living in mass societies of a certain kind, even though nobody had ever seen a city. It sounds counterintuitive, but it is what we see in the intervening centuries in the evidence of villages scattered across a large region from southwestern Iran to much of Iraq and all the way over the Turkish highlands. In many ways, this phenomenon was another function of the kind of culture, uh, culture areas or hospitality zones that we discussed in earlier chapters. But there was a different element, affinities between the stand households and households and families seem seem to have been increasingly based on a principle of cultural uniformity. In a sense, then, this was the first era of the global village. What it all looks like in the archaeological record is impossible to miss. We write from the from first hand experience here. Since one of us one of us has conducted archaeological investigations of prehistoric villages in Iraqi Kurdistan, 
dating before and after the great transformation took place what you find in the fifth millennium bc is the gradual disappearance for from village life of most or what find signs of difference of individuality but as administrative tools and other new media technologies spread across the last west of the middle east households were now built to increasingly standard pre-partive plans and pottery which had once been a way of expressing individual skill and creativity now seems to have been made deliberately draped uniform and in some cases almost standardized craft production in general become more mechanical and female labor was subject to new forms of spatial control and segregation in fact this entire period lasting around 1000 years archaeologists call, call it Ubaid after the site of the of Tel al ubaid in southern Iraq was one of innovation in metallurgy, horticulture, textile, beard and long distance trade but from a social vantage point everything seems to have been done to prevent such innovations become markers of rank or individual distinction in other words to prevent the emergence of fierce differences in status both within and between villages intriguingly it is possible that we are witnessing the birth of an overt ideology of equality in centuries prior to the emergence of the world's, of the world's first cities and the administrative tools were first designed not as means of extracting and accumulating wealth but precisely to prevent such things from happening to get a sense of how such small-scale bureaucracies might have worked in practice we can briefly consider again the ILU Los Andean, Los Andean village associations which as we mentioned earlier had their own home ground administration ILU too were based on a strong principle of equality their members literally wore uniforms with each family having its own traditional design of cloth one of the ILU's main functions was to redistribute agricultural land as families grew larger or smaller to ensure none grew richer than any other indeed to be a rich household meant in practice to have a large number of unmarried children hence much land since there was no other basis for comparing wealth ILU also helped families avoid seasonal level countries and kept track of the number of able-bodied young able-bodied young men and women in each household so as to ensure not only that none were short-handed at critical moments but so that the age of infirm widows or pans or disabled were taken care of between households responsibilities came down to a principle of reciprocity records were kept records were kept at the end of each year of each year all outstanding credits and debts were to be cancelled out this is where the village bureaucracy comes in to do to do that main units of work had to be measured in a way which allowed clear resolution to the inevitable arguments that crop up in such situations about who about who did what for what for whom and who out what to whom each ILU, each ILU appears to have had its own kipu strings which constantly ignored and renowned to keep track as debts were registered or cancelled out it's possible that kipu were invented for such purposes in other words although the actual administrative tools used were different the reason for their assistance was quite similar to what we emphasize for the various accounting systems in prehistoric Mesopotamia and rooted in all in a similar with explicit idea of equality. Of course, the danger of such accounting procedures is that that is that they can be turned to other purposes. The precise system of equivalence that underlies them had the potential to give a most any social arrangement, even those founded on arbitrary violence, e.g., conquest, and error, or even handedness and equity. 
that is why sovereignty administration makes us a potentially lethal combination taking the equalizing effects of the latter and transforming them into tools of social domination even tyranny under the inca let's recall all ailus were reduced to the status of conquered women and kipu strings were employed to keep track of labor debts out to the central inca administration unlike the local string records this work this work fixed and non and non-negotiable the knots were never unraveled at the here it is necessary to overcome a few myths about the inca who are often portrayed as the middlest of empires even a kind of a kind of benevolent proto-socialist state in fact it was the pre-existing ideal system that continued to provide social security under inca rule by contrast the overarching administrative structure put in place by the inca court was largely extractive and exploitative exploitative in nature even if local officers of the court preferred to mis misrepent, misrepent it as an extension of ILO principles for purposes of central monitoring and recording households were grouped into into units of 10 50 100 500 1000 5000 and so on it's responsible for lower for global ob obligators over and above those and of above those they ultimate they already opt to the community in a way that could only place havoc with existing allegiances geography and communal organization coffee coffee duties were assigned uniformly according to a greek scale of measurement work tax might simply be invented if there was nothing that needed doing scope loss face severe punishment this is the results were predictable and we can see them clearly reflected in the first hand in the first hand accounts supplied by spanish chronicles of the time who took an obvious interest in inca strategies of conquest and domination in their local workings community leaders become became de facto state against and either and either to advantage of legalisms to take to get rich or try to sit their words and themselves if they got if they got in to trouble those who were unable to meet labor labor debts or who tried unsuccessfully to flee or rebel were reduced to the status of servants returners and concubines for inca courts and officials this new class of hereditary peons was growing rapidly at the time of spanish conquest none of which is to say the inca reputation as adept administrators is unfounded they apparently were capable of keeping exact track of births and deaths adjusting household numbers at the year at yearly festivals and so on why then impose such an oddly clumsy and monolithic system system on to an existing one the ILU, which was clearly more advanced it's hard to escape the impression that in all such situations the apparent heavy handed handedness the insistence on following the rules even even when they make no sense is really half the point perhaps this simply how sovereignty manifests itself in bureaucratic form by ignoring the unique history of evil of every household each individual by reducing everything to numbers one provides a language of equity but simultaneously ensures that there will be there will always be some who fail to meet their not the quotas and therefore that there will be there will be there will always be a supply of pounds pounds of slaves in the middle east very similar things appear to have happened in later periods of history most famously perhaps the books of the prophet in the hebrew bible preserve memories of powerful protests that ensued as the men as the mess for tribute drove farmers in penury forced them to pound their flocks and vineyards and ultimately surrender their children into debt peonage or wealthy merchants and administrators to a of crop failures, floods, natural disasters, 
or neighbor simple or neighbor simple bad luck to over integrous bearing holons that led that led to the same results similar complaints are recorded are recorded in china and india as well the first establishment of bureaucratic empires is almost always accompanied by some kind of system of equivalence run amok this is not the flesh of thought line a history of money of money and debt only to note that it's no coincidence that societies like those of Europe, areas, Mesopotamia were simultaneously commercial and bureaucratic. Both money and administration are based on similar principles of, pers of personal equivalence. Of impersonal equivalence. What we wish to emphasize at this point is how frequently is how frequently the most violent inequalities seem to arise. In the first instance, for such fixtures of legal equality, all citizens of a city or all worshippers of its god or, or, or all subjects of its king were considered ultimately the same, at least in that one specific way. The same laws, the same rights, the same responsibilities apply to all of them, whether as individuals or in later and more patriarchal times as families under the ages of some part pater familias. What's important here is that is the fact that this equal this equality could be viewed as making people as well as things un interchangeable, which in turn allowed rulers of the henchmen to make impersonal demands that look that took no consideration of the subject's unique subject's unique situation. This is of course what gives the word bureaucracy such distasteful associations almost everywhere today. The fairy term evokes mechanical stupidity, but there is no reason to believe that impersonal systems were originally or are necessarily stupid. If the calculation of, of, of a Bolivian ILU or bus Council uh, or presumably of Neolithic village administration like that of Tel Shavi Abiyad, and its urban successors in Mesopotamia produced an obvious impossible or unreasonable result. Matter, matters could always be adjusted, as anyone knows who had, served, who had spent time in a rural, rural community or serving on a municipal or parish council of a large city. Resolving such inquiries might require in many hours, possibility days of tedious discussion. But al but almost always a solution will be arrived at that no one finds entirely unfair. It's the addition of sovereign power and the resulting ability of the local enfor enforcers to say, rulers, rul rules are rulers, rules are rules, I don't want to hear about it, that allows bureaucratic mechanisms to become genuinely monstrous. Over the course of this book, we have had occasion to refer to the three primordial freedoms, those which, for most of human history, were simply assumed. The freedom to move, the freedom to disobey, and the freedom to create or transform social relationships. We also noted how the English word free ultimately derives from a Germanic term which mean from a Germanic term meaning friend. Since, unlike free people, slaves cannot have friends because they cannot make commitments or promises. The freedom to make promises is about the most basic and minimal element of our third freedom. Much as physically running away from a difficult situation is the most basic is the most basic element for the first of the first. In fact, the earliest word for freedom recorded in any human language in Sumerian term Amagi, which literally means return to mother, because Sumerian kings would periodically issue decrees of their freedom, cancelling all their commercial debts, in in some cases allowing those held uh, allowing those held as champions in their creditors in their creditors' households to return home to the king. One might ask, how could that most basic element of all human freedoms, the freedom to make the to make promises and commitments and thus build relationships, be turned into its very opposite, 
into peonage, serfdom, or permanent slavery. It happens. Which suggests precisely with Bob when promise become impersonal, transferable, in not sell to your cutties. It is what of history is cut ironies that Madame de Gravigny notion of the incasted as a model of a benevolent bureaucratic order actually derives from a misreading of the sources, if a very common one, mistaking the social benefits of loyal, of local, self organized administrative units, ILU, for an imperial infrastructure of command, which in reality serve almost exclusively to provision the army, priesthood, and administrative classes. Mesopotamian and later Chinese kings also tended to represent themselves like the Egyptian nomarchs as protectors of the weak, feeders of the hungry, soldiers of widows and orphans. As money is to promises, we might say state bureaucracy is to the principle of care. In each case, we find one of the most fundamental building blocks of social life corrupted by a confluence of maths and violence in which, armed um, with new knowledge, we retain some basic premises of social evolution. Social scientists and political philosophers have been debating on the origin have been debating the origins of the state of the state for well over a century. Their debates are never resolved and are unlikely ever to be at this point. At least we can understand why. Much like the search for the origins of inequality, seeking the origins of the state is little more than chasing a phantasm. As we know that at the beginning of the chapter, it never occurred to the Spanish conquistadors to ask whether or not they were dealing with state states, it says, since the concept didn't really exist at the time. The language they use of kingdoms, empires, and republics served just as well in, in and in many ways rather better. Historians, of course, will speak of kingdoms, empires, and republics if social scientists have come with the reverse language of states and state formation, it's largely because, it, because this is taken to be more scientific despite the lack of consistent definition. It's not clear why. Part of the reason might be that the notion of the state and of modern science both emerge around the same time and were to a certain degree entangled with one another. Whatever the cause, because the existing literature is so relentlessly focused on a single narrative on increasing and increasing complexity, hierarchy and state formation, it becomes very difficult to use the term state for any other purpose. The fact that our planet is, at the present time, almost entirely covered by state of history makes it, very, makes it easy to write as if such an outcome was inevitable. Yet our present situation regularly leads, to, leads people to make scientific assumptions about how we got here that have almost nothing to do with the actual data. Certain salient features current arrangements are just project backwards, presumed to exist once society has, has attained a certain degree of complexity unless the definitive evidence of the appearance can be produced. For example, it is often simply assumed that state, states begin with certain key functions of government, military, administrative, and judicial pass into the hands of full-time specialists. This makes, this makes sense. If you make, if you accept the negative depth that an agricultural surplus, an agricultural surplus feeds, uh, feeds up a significant portion of the population of the one whose one who's responsibility of securing adequate amounts of food, a story that suggests at the beginning of a process that would lead to our current global division of labor. Each state might have used the surplus largely to support full-time bureaucrats, priests, soldiers, and the like, but we are always reminded its existence was a lot for full-time sculptures, poets, and astronomers. It is a compelling story. It also quite too when applied to our present-day situation, at least 
only a small percentage of us are now involved in, in the production and distribution of food foodstuffs. However, almost none of the regimes we've been considering in this chapter were actually staffed with, by full-time specialists. Most of you see, none seem to have had a standing army. Warfare uh, largely, uh, was largely a business for the agricultural offices. Priests and judges rarely work full time either. In fact, most government institutions in Old Kingdom Egypt, Shang China, early dynasty Mesopotamia, or for that matter, classical Athens, were staffed by a rotating box, box whose, whose members whose, whose members had other lives as managers of rural estates, traders, builders, or any other differ, or any number of different occupations. One could go, one could go further. It's not, it's not clear to what degree many of these early states were themselves largely recessional phenomena. Recall that at least as far back as far back as the Ice Age, seasonal gatherings could be stages for the performance of something that looks to us a bit like kingship. Rulers had rulers had called only during certain periods of the year and some clans of various societies were given state like police po po police powers police police powers only only during the winter months. Like warfare, the business of government tended to concentrate strongly upon certain types of year. They were mournful of they were mournful of building projects, pageants, festivals, census taking, odds of allegiance, trials and spectacular executions, and other uh, and other times when a king's when, when a king's subject when a king's subjects and sometimes even the king's even the king himself scattered to attend uh, to the most organ needs of planting, harvesting and pasturage. This not this doesn't mean these kingdoms weren't real. They were capable of mobilizing or for that matter, killing and maiming dozens of human beings. It just means that they really was in effect sporadic. They appeared at and then they dissolved that the way. Could it be that in the same way that are uh, the play the play farming? Our time for those loose and flexible methods for cultivation, for, for cultivation, which leave people free to pursue any number of other seasonal activities, turns into more serious agriculture. The kingdoms began to take on more substance as well. This evidence for Egypt might be interpreted along these lines, but it's also impossible that both these processes when they did it happen, were ultimately driven by something else, such as the emergence of patriarchal relations and the decline of women's power within the household. Surely, these are the, ki the kinds of questions we should be asking. Ethnography, who teach, teaches us that kings are greatly content with the idea of being a sporadic presence in most of their subjects', subjects lives. Even rules of kingdoms that nobody would describe as a state, like the Siluk Red or rulers of, of minor principalities in Java or Madagascar, will try to insert themselves into, a, into the rhythms of ordinary social life, insisting that no one can swear on an oath or marry or even greet one another without invoking their name. In this manner, the king would become the necessary means by his subjects establish relations with each other in much the same way as later heads of state would insist on putting their faces on money. In 1852, the Western minister and missionary Richard B. Leeds, Richard B. Leeds described how in the Fijian kingdom of Kakaudrof there was a daily goal of absolute silence at, at, at sunrise. Then, then the king's herald would proclaim that he was about to chew his kavagut, whereon his old subjects shouted, Chew it! This was followed by a, a thunderous roar when the ritual was completed. The, rulers were, the ruler was the son who gave God's life and order to his people. He created the universe each day. 
In fact, most scholars know where this insist this king wasn't even a king, but merely the head of a confederacy, confederacy of chiefdoms who ruled over perhaps a few thousand people. Such cosmic claims are regularly made in royal ritual almost everywhere in the, in the world, and their grandeur seems to be of almost no relation to a ruler's actual power as in their ability to make anyone do anything they don't want to do. If the state means anything, it refers to precisely the totalitarian impulse that lies behind all such claims that desire effectively to make the ritual last forever. Monuments like the Egyptian pyramids seem to have served a similar purpose. There were attempts to make a certain kind of of power seem eternal, the kind that only really manifested itself in those particular months when pyramid construction was underway. Inscriptions of objects designed to approach the image of cosmic power palaces, mausoleums, levies, stele, with godlike figures announcing laws or boasting of their conquest, are precisely the ones most brightly to endure day by bombing all core of the world's major heritage sites and museum collections today. Such in their power that even now we risk falling under their spell. We don't really know how seriously to take them. After all, the Fijian subjects or the king of Kaukaudrov must at least must at least have been willing to play along with the daily sunrise ritual, since he lacked much in the way of means to compel them. Yet rulers such as Sargon the Great of Akkad, of Akkad or the first emperor of China had many such means at their disposal. And as a result we can say we can say less about what their subjects really made of their more grandiose claims. To understand the realities of power world in modern and Russian societies is an acknowledged this gap between what it did and its claim they can do and what they are actually able to able to do. As the sociologist Philip Abraham pointed out long ago, fellow to make this distinction had let social social scientists up countless by an alleys, but at least because the state is not the reality which stands behind the marks of political practice. It is itself the marks which prevents our seeing political practice as it is. To understand the latter, he argued we must attend to senses to the senses in which the state does not exist rather than to those in which it does. We can now see that these points at play just as closely to ancient political regimes as they as they do, do as they do to modern ones if not if not more so. An origin for the state has long been sought in such diverse places as ancient Egypt, in Kaper and Sang China, but what we now regard as states turned out not to be a constant of history at all, nor the result of a long revolutionary process that we get in the Bronze Age, but rather a confluence of three political forms, sovereignty, administration, and charismatic competition that have different origins. Modern states are simply one way in which the three principles of domination happen to come together, but this time with the notion that the power of kings is held by an entity called the people of the, of the nation, the bureaucracies exist to be the benefit of said people, in which, and in which a Ferguson and on all aristocratic contest and prices has come to be reliable as democracy, most often in the form of national elections. There was nothing inevitable about it. If proof of that were required, we need only observe how much this particular arrangement is currently coming apart. As we noted too, there, as we noted, there are no planetary bureaucracies, public and private, ranging from IMF and WTO to GP Morgan Chase and various credit rating agencies without anything that resembles 
resembles a corresponding principle of global sovereignty of glo or global field of competitive politics and everything from cryptocurrencies to private security agencies undermining the sovereignty of states. If anything is clear by now, it's this. When we where we once assume civilization instead to be conjoined entities, entities that came down to us as an historical package, take it or leave it forever. What the story now demonstrates is that these terms actually refer to complex amalgams of elements which have entirely entirely different origins and which are currently in the process of drifting apart. Seeing this way, to retain the basic premises of social evolution is to retain the, the, the very idea of politics itself. Koda on civilization, empty walls, and histories still to be written. On reflection, it's odd that it's odd that the term civilization, one with not this with not discussion, with not discussed much until now. Even, even came to use this way in the first place. When people talk about early civilizations, they are mostly referring to those very same societies we've been describing in this chapter and their direct successors, Fario the Egypt, Inca Peru, Ajab, Aztec, Mexico, Han China, Imperial Rome, Ancient Greece, or others of the certain scale of monumentality. All these were deeply stratified societies held together mostly by auto authoritarian government, violence, and the radical subordination of women. Sacrifice, as we've seen, is the shadow lurking behind this concept of civilization. The, the sacrifice of our three basic freedoms or of life itself for the sake of something always out of reach, whether that be an ideal of world order, the mandate of heaven of blessings, from in this insatiable gods. Is it any wonder that in some cycles the very idea of civilization has fallen into this script? Something very basic has, has gone wrong here. One problem is that we've come to assume that civilization refers in origin simply to the habit of living in cities. Cities in turn were thought to imply states as we've seen as we've seen but as we've seen this is not the case historically or even etymologically the word civilization derives from latin civilis which actually refers to those qualities of political wisdom and mutual aid that permit societies to organize themselves to voluntary voluntary coalition in other words it originally meant the type of qualities exhibit, exhibited by under ilu associates associations of box villages rather than in courtes of some dynasties dynast if mutual aid if mutual aid social cooperation civic activism hospitality or simply caring for others that are kind of the hospitality of simply or simply caring for the art for others are the kind of things that really go to make civilizations, then this true history of civilization is, ju is only just starting to be written. As we saw in chapter 5, Mazamas took some initial positive steps in that direction but was largely ignored, and as he anticipated, such as history might well begin to dose and geographically expansive cultural areas or interaction spheres that archaeologists cannot trace back into periods for earlier than kingdoms or empires or even cities, as we've seen physical evidence left behind by common forms by of domestic life, ritual and hospitality shows us this deep history of his civilization. In some ways it's much more inspiring than monuments. It's in some ways it's much more inspiring than monuments. Agreeably, the most important findings of modern archaeology are precisely this vibrant and far long than works of kinship and comments and commerce when those who rely largely on speculation have expected to find only backward and isolated tribes as we've seen as we've been showing 
to throughout this book in all parts of the world so small communities from civilizations in the true sense of extended moral communities without Bergman and kings bureaucrats outstanding armies for they fostered the god the fostered the god of mathematical and calendrical knowledge in some regions they are beyond the metallurgy the cultivation of olives vines and dead palms or the invention of the of living bed and wet bed in other in others they domesticated means and learned to extract poisons medicines and mind altering substances from plants civilization civilizations in this two sense developed the major textile technologies applied to fabrics and basketry and potter will stone industries and bedwork and bedwork the sail at the sail and maritime navigation and so on a moment's reflection shows the moment that women their work their concerns and innovations are at the core of this more accurate understanding of civilization as we saw in earlier chapters tracing the place of women in societies without writing often means using clues left quite literally in the fabric of material culture such as, such as painted ceramics that mimic both the both, texti, both textiles designs and female bodies in their forms and elaborate decorative structures to take just two examples it's hard to believe that the kind of complex mathematical knowledge displayed in early mesopotamian cuneiform documents or in the layout of Ferus Javin temples sprang fully formed from the mind of a male scribe of sculpture like Athena from the head of Zeus. Far more likely, this represent knowledge accumulated in earlier times through, conce through concrete practice practice practices such as the solid geometry and applied calculus of weaving of bedwork or bedwork. What until now? Her's first for civilization might in fact be nothing more than a gender appropriation by men etching the claims to in stone of some earlier system of knowledge that had warm in its center. We began this, cha this chapter by noting how often the expansion of ambis ambitious polities and the concentration of power in a few hands was accompanied by the marginalization of women if not the violent subordination. This seems to be true not just of second order regimes like Aztec Mexico and Old Kingdom Egypt but also of first order ones like Chevin the Hunter. But what about cases where even as society scaled up and also took on more centralist forms of government, women and their concerns and concerns remain at the core of the thing of things. Do any such such exist in history? This brings us to our final example, Minoan Crete. Whatever was was happening during the Bronze Age on Crete, the largest and most southerly of Aegean islands, islands, it clearly doesn't quite fit the scholarly playbook of state formation. Yet the remains of what has come to be called Minoan society are too dramatic too impressive and too close to the, to the heart of Europe and what was to become the classical world to be, slight, to be sidelined or ignored. Indeed, in the 1970s, the renowned, the renowned archaeologist Colin Rinfeu chose nothing less than the emergence of civilization as the title of his important book on the prehistory of the Aegean to the eternal confusion and annoyance of archaeologists working anywhere else. Despite this high profile and more than a century of intense build work, Minoan Crete remains a kind of beautifully written for archaeological theory and frankly a source of puzzlement to anyone coming at the topic from outside. Much of our, much of our knowledge comes from the metropolis of Knossos as well as other major centers at the Phaistos, Malia, and Zagros, which are usually described as palatial societies that existed between 1,700 
and 14 and, and 1450 BC, the Neo-Palatial or New Palace period. Certainly, they were they were impre very impressive places at this time. Knossos grew out to have had a population about 2,000 to 25,000. Thousand in many ways resembles similar cities in other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean, centering as it does on large palace complexes replete with industrial cutters and storage facilities and the system of writing on clay tablets, Linear A, which, frustratingly, has never been disappeared. The problem is that, unlike palatial societies of roughly the same age, such as those of Simrilim at Mari on the Syrian Ephrates or in Hittite Anatolia to the north or Egypt, there is simply no clever evidence of monarchy on mean one crate. It's not for lack for for it's for, it's not for lack of material. We might not be able to read the writing, but Crete and the nearby island of Terra or Santorini were a bed of volcanic ash prefer preserved preserves the mean one town of Arco theory in splendid detail, actually furnish us with one of the most extensive bodies of pictorial art from the Bronze Age world, not just West Coast, but also ivories and detailed engravings on seals and jewelry, by far the most frequent de depictions of authority features in mean one. In Minwan art, in Minwan art, saw adult women in bodily patent skits that extend over, set all over their shoulders but are open at the chest. Women are regularly depicted at the last scale than men, a sign of political superiority in the visual traditions of all neighboring lands. They hold symbols of command, like the staff wielding mother of mountains, who appears on seal impressions from a major sign at Nosos that perform fertility rites before the hard altars, sit on thrones, meet together in assemblies with no male presiding and appear flanked by supernatural creatures and dangerous animals. Most male depictions, on the other hand, are either scantily clad or naked athletes. No women are depicted naked in mean one art. Also, also men bringing the tribute or an adopting process of subservience sub before female dignitaries. All this, all this, all this is without parallel in the highly patriarchal societies in, of Syria, Lebanon, Anatolia, and Egypt. All regions that Cretan of the time were familiar with, since they visited them as traders and diplomats. Scholarly interpretations of mean one palatial art. With its array, with its array of powerful females, are some type are somewhat perplexing. First, follow a two events: the early 20th century excavation of Knossos, in, ident in identifying such figures of goddesses or priestesses wielding an earthly power almost, power almost as though they have no connection to the real world. They tend to come up in the religion and ritual section sections of books on Asian art and archaeology as opposed to, to politics, economics, or social structure, politics in particular, being reconstructed with almost no reference to the art at all. Others simply avoid the issues as you altogether, describing meanwhile political life as clearly different but ultimately impenetrable a gendered sentiment if ever there was one. Would this keep happening if these were images of men in positions of authority? Unlikely, since the same scholars usually have no trouble identifying similar scenes that involve males painted on the walls of Egyptian tombs, for example, or even actual representations of Ketiu, Kitans, bring tribute to powerful Egyptian men as reflections of real power relations. Real power relations. Another passing bit of evidence is the nature of their works that mean one male sons imported from, ab from abroad. Mean ones were the trading people, and the traders appear to have been mostly men. But starting in the Porto Palatial period, what they brought home what they brought home from overseas had a distinctively female flavor. 
Egyptian Sistra, Comestic, Comestic Jars, Free Jars of Nursing Mothers and Scrap and Scarab Amulets do not come from the male from the from the male dominated sphere of courtly culture by the rituals of non royal Egyptian women and the genocentric rites of Hathor. Hathor was celebrated outside Egypt too, in temples near the Sinai turquoise mines and in maritime ports where the horn goddesses goddess morph into a protector of cavaliers. One such port was Biblos on the Lebanon's coast, where an assemblage of cosmetics and amulets, almost identical to those from early Cretan tombs, was found buried as offerings in a temple. Most likely, such objects travel along with women's cults, perhaps like the much later cults of Isis, breaking the official trade of male elites. The concentration of these items within prestigious Cretan Tholos tombs in the period just before the formation of palaces, another of those neglected proto periods suggests, at very least, that women occupied the Neiman side of such long distance exchanges. Again, this was most this was most definitively not the case elsewhere. To throw things into relief, let's briefly consider the study later palaces of mainland Greece. Cretan palaces were unfortified, and mean one art makes almost no reference to war, dwelling instead of scenes of play and attention to create to create the comforts. All, all this is all this is in marked contrast to what was happening on the Greek mainland. World citadels arose to arose at Mycenae, Pylos, and Tyrrhenes, and Tyrrhenes. Uh, around 50, uh, around for 1,400 BC, and before, and before long, the rulers launched a successful takeover of Crete, occupying Knossos and uh, assuming control of its hinterland. Compared to Knossos or Phaistos, the residences appear little more than hill forts, parks on key passes in the Pele Peloponnese, and surrounded them by modest hamlets. Mycenae. The biggest had a population of around 6,000. This is not surprising since the palace societies of the mainland don't arise from, from pre existing cities but from warrior aristocracies but produce the earlier self graves of Mycenae but they, with their haunting gold death marks and were even inlaid with scenes of male fighters and hunting bands. On to this institutional foundation, the very young band leader and his hunting retinue were soon added, cultly finally borrowed mainly from the Cretan palaces and the script Linear B, adapted to write the, the Greek language for, for administration. Analysis of the Linear B tablets suggest that just a handful of literate officers did not did not did most of the administrative work themselves personally inspecting crops and livestock, gathering taxes, distributing raw materials to artisans, and supplying provisions for festivals. It was all rather limited and small scale, and the mission one asked, the ruler of Overlord, who have exercised little to sovereignty beyond his citadel, making do with seasonal tax rights on the surrounding population with who lives or the rest went on beyond the scope of royal sovereigns. These Mycenaean overlords held court in the mega of or, or Great Wall, a relatively well prevailed example of which exists at Pylos. Early archaeologists were being a bit fanciful when they imagined this actually to be the palace of the Homeric king Nestor, but there is no doubt one of Homer kings of Homer's kings would have been quiet at home here. The mega centered on a huge hut open to the sky, and the remainder of the space, including the throne, was most likely cast in shadow. The walls bear fair frescoes showing a bull led to slaughter and a bird playing the lyre. The one axe, although no, although no depicted 
although not depicted, is clearly the focus of this processional scenes which confers on his throne. We can contrast this with the throne room of Norse on Crete, identified as such, as such by Arthur Evans. In this case, the purported throne faces on an faces an open space, surrounded by stone benches, symmetrically arranged in rows, so the assembled groups could sit in comfort for long periods. It's visible to all the, the others. Nearby was a step bathing chamber. There are many such lustral basins, as Evans called them, in main one houses and palaces. Archaeologists puzzled for decades over the function until uh, a coterie, a coterie one, such was found directly under a painted scene of a female initiation ceremony, most likely linked to menstruation. In fact, purely architectural grounds, and notwithstanding Evans' greater with spirit insistence that it seems be better adapted for a man. The centerpiece of the throne room may be quite reasonably understood not as the seat of a male monarch, but rather that a council had and its occupants more likely a succession of female councillors. Pretty much all the available evidence for Min One Creed suggests a system of female political rule, effectively a theocracy of some sort governed by a college of priestesses. We might ask, why are contemporary researchers so resistant to this conclusion? One cannot blame everything on the fact that proponents of primitive matriarchy made exaggerated claims back in 1902. Yes, scholars tend to say that this, the cities ruled by colleges of priestesses are, are, are unprecedented in the ethnography or historical record. But by the same logic, one could equally point out that there is no parallel for kingdom run, run by men in which all the visual representations of authority features are the are depictions of women. Something, dif something different was clearly happening on Crete. Certainly, the way in which Minoan artists represent li represented life attests to a profoundly different sensibility to that of Crete's neighbors from mainland Greece. In an essay called The Subs The Subs of Minoan Desire, Check them, she points out that erotic attention seems to be displaced from the female body onto just about every, every other person of life, starting with the elite, scant scantily clad features of young men as they dart in and out of the bodies of girls who tease them or jeered in sporting activities, or the neck boys, or the neck boys who presented the carrying face. It's all a world away from the, from the stiff animal features that populate the walls of Pylos, or indeed those of Simri Lim's god, let alone the scenes of brutal warfare on light Assyrian world reliefs. In the mean one place, first cause everything merges, except that is for the subtly delineated features of those leading females or who stand apart or in small groups, happening, help, happily chatting with one another, admiring some spectacle. Flowers and reeds, birds, fish, dolphins, even hills and mountains are in the thoughts of a perpetual dance, waving in and out of each other. Mean one objects to blend, to blend into one another in an extraordinary play on materials, a true science of the concrete the transport into cast itself and melts the walls of stone, made and clay together into a common realm of forms, each mimicking the others. All this all this unfolds the, to the undulating, undulating rhythms of the sea, the eternal backdrop to this garden of life, and all with a remarkable absence of politics in our sense of what them she calls the self perpetuating power hanky what the scenes celebrate, as she eloquently puts it, is quite the opposite of politics. It is the ritual, ritually induced 
Guileless from individuality and an ecstasy of being that is overtly erotic and spiritual at the same time. Ecstasy, ecstasy, standing beyond oneself, a cosmos that, a cosmos that both nurtures and ignores the individual that vibrates in with inspirable sexual energies and spiritual epiphanies. There are no heroes in mean one art, no one pleasures. Creed of the places or the rim of homo ludens, or perhaps better said, feminine ludens, not to mention feminine potence. What we've learned in this chapter can be briefly summarized. The process, the process usually called the called state formation, can in can in fact mean uh, we, we will doing a number of uh, very different things. It can mean a game of honor or chance can there be wrong or the incorrigible thought of a particular ritual for feeling they did it can mean it can mean industrial slaughter the appropriation by men of female knowledge or governance by a college of priestesses but we've also learned that when studied and compared more closely the rest of possibilities is far from limitless in fact there seem to be both logical and historical contents, constraints on the variety of ways in which power can expand its Europe than these limits are the basis of our three principles of sovereignty, administration, and competitive politics. What we can also see, though, is that even within these constraints, there were far more interesting things going on that we might ever have guessed it guessed by sticking by sticking to any conventional definition definition of the state what was really happening in the mean no one places they seem to have been in some sense theoretical stages in some sense of in some some moments in the initiation societies and administrative hubs all the same time where they where they even a regime of nomination at all it's also important to recall the very uneven nature of the evidence that we've been dealing with. What will we say about Min Wan Kuit or Teoti Wakan or Sato Koyuk for that matter, were it, were, it, were it not for the fact that the elaborate wall paintings happen to have to have been preserved, more than, more than almost any other form of human activity? Painting on walls is something people in virtually any cultural setting seem inclined to do. This has been true almost since the beginnings of humanity itself. We can hardly doubt that similar images were produced on skins and fabrics as well as directly on walls in any number of so-called early states for, from which one from which only bare stone building or building blocks of mud brick enclosures now survive. Archaeology using a barrage of new scientific techniques will undoubtedly reveal many more such those civilizations as you are already in the process of doing from the desert of Saudi Arabia or Peru to the once seemingly empty steppes of Kazakhstan and the tropical forests of Amazonia as the evidence accumulates year on year for last statements and impressive subjects in previously unsuspected locations we'd be wise, we'd be wise to resist projecting some image of the modern nation state onto their bare surfaces and consider what what other kinds of social possibilities they might attest to.